geological parameters, this is not a generic, right? You're you're getting parallels much more specific, especially when you're getting a model and identifying cities that meet it almost exactly, like a super sure earthquake or something. I mean, you're just not going to get that many places where that occurs. So the fact that Sorensen came up, Sorensen didn't know any of this. He just came up with it all within the, and so you've applied another level. It's not really a parallel. It's it's a higher evidentiary level. Is it Mormonism with the Murph? We're already seeing explorers' church history and the church's truth claims. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the Murph, where I've already seen explores the church's history and the church's truth claims. And in today's episode, I'm going to be interviewing Jerry Grover, who is a geologist, and we're going to be discussing in today's episode, Geology and the Book of Mormon. Jerry, thanks for coming on. Yeah, good to be here. Yep, good to have you. Uh, so I, I've done, you know, I, I've been doing a series on the Book of Mormon. I did a recent episode with Frank Gardner, and we looked at, you know, convergences, correlations between the book text of the Book of Mormon and things in Mesoamerica or Mayan culture. Uh, and one of the things that we discussed, he has a chapter in his book, is all about the destruction in Third Nephi and how that uh, converges very, very well with volcanic activity and earthquakes and, and things that would have been happening in Mesoamerica and volcanic eruptions that were happening in that time and location. And he referenced you a lot in that chapter as well and, and i did a wee video as well on archaeological evidence and i talked a little about you know the the convergences between the destruction in third nephi and what we know about volcanic eruptions and you know sharp lightning storms earthquakes uh sunken cities and i i find that to me really fascinating um you know how well it converged and and this is your this is your specialism your expertise uh, and we're going to be diving in a lot more depth today so there's going to be a lot of slides and uh this is going to be really going in deep on on geology but before we we dive into the topic do you want just to just tell us a little about who you are briefly your background with the church anything about your you know uh your academic uh career okay yeah um uh more or less born in the church i guess you'd say um my father was a, ended up being a professor in the engineering college at byu so um, kind of grew up in, uh, and you're an engineer as well. Uh, I read that. Yeah, as well. I'm a structure. I'm a licensed structural civil engineer as well. So, so right, I got cool. my undergrad. I, I, you know, I, I wasn't didn't take seminary or anything. I was active church, but I wasn't really, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know. I took physics instead. Kind of, kind of a nerdy guy. So I don't. Right. I, 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 I was active in church and, and things, and then I did serve a mission uh, down in Sicily um got five kids you know had a family they're all grown now but but basically i got my undergraduate in geological engineering and then was accepted as a mechanical engineering grad student um and then shifted to civil engineering and got my civil engineering master's degree and then i've got licenses in both uh, through state of utah work-wise i worked um Geology-wise, I did precious metal exploration in the Western United States. Um, I've done a few of my own joint ventures in gold exploration with some larger mining companies. I worked for Marathon Oil for a little while in oil. I did a lot of oil shale mapping, that kind of thing. And then volcanics, I did a lot of mapping of volcanics. I mean, it, actually, in, in the precious metal exploration, a lot of your models that you're looking at the geologic models involve volcanics and um so i mean i'm pretty familiar with with volcanoes i was born in hawaii right so i I've oh yeah <laughs> so, I, I've, I've never volcano. seen a volcano before over over here in ireland we don't uh we don't really have them <laughs> yeah well most geologists that's their dream is to die in a volcanic eruption you know <laughs> oh wow <laughs> <laughs> you know kind of if, if, once they've been you know towards the end of their life you know <laughs> <laughs> good way to go good way to go right, exactly so, uh, and you, you've also done a lot of research in, in different topics you know we'll probably bring you back on but you've you, you did work on the characters document. You've done work on the gold plates, uh, Jaredite names. So you're somebody who do, does a lot of research and is very much interested in sort of like diving deep into different aspects of uh, yeah. Mormonism. Yeah. And like I, I, I've done, you know, I did the order 
Order of Nihor and Mesoamerica, comparative stuff with the Mayan religion, the book on that. Um, so I, I've done, and I, all my books are free to download in PDF format. I don't, I'm not selling books. I mean, I do print a limited number or libraries will buy them or whatever. And then if people want hard copies, I have a few, but I'm not in the business of making money from it. Yeah. And I'm not really what you call, I mean, I don't really know what people want to define as an apologist. I mean, I don't really go out. I don't really respond. I'm not trying to, you know, in fact, my research is driven by what I'm interested in. Mm. Not what, not what people, you know, not to respond to the most recent attack or something. I mean, I, I do, if people want to ask me questions about it, but because that's one thing I saw is, and I, I knew John Sorensen personally, you know, and, and his actually, I work, uh, currently work at a, it's a old, I worked at a, a steel mill as an engineer. And then I was a county commissioner for 12 years in politics and then oh, okay. came back. Yeah, came back. The mill got shut down, and and so I've, we've done the demolition and I'm doing all the cleanup and everything. But John Sorensen actually his master's or his PhD thesis was on this mill, you know, so it, it, not really right. related to, to Mormon stuff. So I actually had a lot of background with John Sorensen, you know, and then you know, I just had me. And we'll get into this later, but um, you would say the the geology in in Mesoamerica and the volcanic activity. Uh, sort of would align and uh, corroborate uh, his uh, geography model in in Mesoamerica, which is something that's pretty cool as well. Yeah. It's a, another discipline, uh, sort of examining uh, the, the history and the geography in Mesoamerica, and this sort of supports uh, his his theory for where it happened. Yeah, and as we'll get into the, I'm, I'm kind of you know we're going to do a PowerPoint. A lot of it's just straight out of the book. Some I've had, got some additional because the book was written what seven eight years ago. Yeah, but but part of it was, uh, um, you have all these. If you're doing geographic models, which honestly there are not that many, and even the ones that say they're models aren't really because they really, uh, basically making a map is not a model. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> there are thousands of people making maps. You know, oh here's a narrow neck over here and whatever it is, you actually have to go through and look at all the parameters in the text whether they be, you know, geographic, directional, cultural, that's a full model, meaning you actually have to, you, you can't just cherry pick, right? And so right. one of the parameters that really had not been developed was the geology, right? And so that's part of the work of the book is to say, okay, we, we have this general concept, okay, there are earthquakes, um, you know, probably a volcano, but you have to actually lay that on the ground, right? You can't, it's a parameter you have to apply to your model uh, and see if that fits too. And so mm -hmm. it was more or less designed, not, I mean, the Sorensen model was developed, so it was easy to actually compare that one. But anybody that develops a model needs to take into account as a parameter of the geology. If they just ignore it, well, then they're not, it's not really a true model, right? I mean, so it's just a- right. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, I, it kind of reminds I, me of uh, when I talked with Brant Gardner and he talked about how convergences is almost a little bit different to parallels. And as he was, um, you know, trying to make some of the correlations between Mesoamerica and the Book of Mormon, it's not just geography, but it's peoples being there at the right time. And then, as you said, you know, geology on top of that as well, that all those things kind of need to fit for it to work. Right. Like the right and, geography, and, but you don't have people there at the right time, then that would present a problem. Exactly. And, you know, it's recognized that some of the passages can be interpreted in different ways. I mean, there was no punctuation, right? So commas were added and that can change. So, so mm -hmm. there is, as long as they take, if they're interpreting it differently, as long as they say that, then I consider that. But because a lot of people say, hey, look at my model. I'm like, you don't have it developed enough for me to even worry about. Okay. <laughs> because I can't apply anything. You don't even have any cities anywhere, you know, I mean, yeah. is, and so it's like, you don't, you haven't even got to, you know, I call them like stage one, stage two, even in Mesoamerica, some people, you know, throw out, of course, in Mesoamerica, I kind of told Brad, I said, my opinion, the way I look at it, there's the Grijalva river model, the Yusima center river model and the tour guide model. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So wherever they want to take people on the tour ends up being where the Nephites were. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, what I'm saying is there's a lot of people have things, but, you know, but 
some of them are just motivated to their own business thing or their own proclivities. Right, they, right. They aren't really objective, right? And so, sure, sure. So, th so this geology book is if, as we go through it, you're seeing. I'm trying to say, whoever you are, these are the kinds of things you need to look at and apply to your model. Well, that's important. So, so we're going to be going through. You prepared your slides. I'm probably going to limit my contribution uh unless i you know it's important comment or question i might have but i'll let you sort of go through your slides you're going to be talking about sort of like geology in in general talk about volcanoes and then talking about sort of uh what we know about volcanic eruptions in mesoamerica around that time earthquakes and things and how this correlates with the book of mormon's you know description of the destruction in third nephi uh and then we're thinking in part two to discuss more geology with the the heartland model and uh, and does geology support that and some other uh, questions as well with geology and such. Uh, but I'll, uh, if you want to bring up your slides and we can dive in, unless okay. there's anything else you want to say before we jump in. Okay. And by the way, listeners, if I'm looking a bit pink and shiny, we're having a, a heat wave here in, in Northern Ireland and I was playing tennis uh, today, had a tennis match and I'm a little bit on the pinky side. Well, that's, that's funny because you said you've had bad weather where you're at storms and it's, it's been raining and it's the opposite here. We're, we're, it usually rains most of the year, but a uh, heat wave this week. Well, it looks like you've been exposed to a pyroclastic flow, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to smother some olive oil on. <laughs> so again, this a lot of this is coming from this uh, geology book and we'll talk later. I mean, all of my books available for free, so I do have a website where at bmslr.org where you can anybody can download this book that's interested and you have uh, other books there as well like that yeah I, I downloaded the characters document and you also sent me a copy of that but all your books are there so i'll put a link in the description where people can uh can go to the website if they want to read your book and then i have uh, also have a page on academia.edu where there's actually some little papers i've done that aren't on my website you know like looking at the great city definition and I mean, just kind of small little things. So awesome. I'll link that in as well. So, so um, again, the scope of the book was to provide an explanation for all the geological events described in the book of Mormon. That being said, there was one I didn't really deal with. And that was um, Lehi when he went out um, for his prophetic calling, he had observed a, um, a you know, a pillar of fire on the rock, I meaning kind of an Exodus theme. So there are a few things in this presentation that are not in the book that I've added. So as we go through, I'll, you know, so if you get the, it would be important to actually, you know, kind of refer to this too, if you want the complete information, the book. Does right. Because like so. it's not just uh third Nephi destruction in third Nephi. You also have a couple of slides where you talk about uh, Ammonihah and the prison collapsing and right. how that ties in with geology as well, which is really interesting and shows you're trying to be quite thorough as well. Yeah. Well, now, what I'm saying is in this presentation, there's a few things I didn't have in the book that you'll see here. So I've not updated the book, but um, so I'm just letting people know that you might want to also, if you want to complete, you probably need to look at this presentation and then also as well. Yeah. Awesome. So the, the scope was, there were papers done by a couple of BYU professors kind of comparing the third Nephi event to a volcanic eruption, the Bart Koalas and Dr. Bear and a few others. But nobody had ever tried to really apply that on the ground other than just a general principle. So I said, okay, we need to, you know, we need to learn how to set up parameters to apply this to a model. And especially we're going to look at Mesoamerica because the Sorensen model is the most developed and more widely accepted, I guess you could say, model down there. Uh, a little bit of just kind of geology 101 here, uh, just so when we get in, you know, if I get into the weeds, I don't. <laughs> this is bringing me back to my junior high days <laughs> yeah so if we get into the weeds at least you have a lawnmower with you know to help you <laughs> but um so basically basically the it's called plate tectonics is basically what's happening to the crust of the earth you have separation of there's different plates you call them floating on the mantle floating on you know on top of this more molten um uh, material at depth and some of the plates you have where they're separating going apart some where they're going underneath and so you have a subduction zone where they're going underneath and then sometimes the plates shift um, laterally along each other they don't they're not 
because they're they're kind of jostling around and some of them are rotating so it's it's not like this perfect because it's also a sphere right so there's not like it's not flat mesoamerica specifically don't get too scared by this diagram but um you can, you can see my arrow right my cursor yep yep okay okay so essentially you have this here is a trench this these arrows are talking about this plate the cocos plate going underneath so this is a subduction zone going under the caribbean plate there's also the north american plate which are moving against each other as well mm. they're actually kind of rotating so there's it's and it's very mesoamerica is very complex in terms of of the geology because you have it's like three plate boundaries not just very simple right and then what happens, uh, as we'll talk about, when you have a subduction zone, a certain distance, you know, as it's going underneath and getting um, melting into the mantle, material comes up, lighter material, and you get these volcanic arcs. So you have volcanoes that form um, a certain, you know, typical distance away from the subduction zone. Those that are in America are familiar with Mount St. Helens, Mount Shasta, Mount Rainier up there in Oregon and, and um, uh, Washington, there's a plate, the Juan de Fuca plate is going underneath um, there. And so you have a, a string of volcanoes running north and south. So that's the volcanic arc that maybe more people would be familiar with. And so anyway, that kind of gives you the general geology. As I said, this is a kind of a cross section showing what's happening. You have the, you know, this Cocos plate going underneath the Caribbean. Then you have this material that comes up, gets under pressure, is a magma chamber. And then once enough pressure has built up, uh, you can have a volcanic eruption. But um, so it's basically just talking about, you know, the basics of what's happening. As I kind of mentioned, these are the more detail on the plates. Um, this is... Uh, you can see they're kind of telling you the way the, the plate is moving. So you have kind of this, the Caribbean plate. So it's complicated because you have the Caribbean plate kind of moving this way. You also have some separation here. Yeah, it's and, not just one direction. Yeah. So some of them are under tension. Some of them are compression because it's a complex plate boundary. So it, it's like it's smushing. It's also stretching depending on what's going on. Does that make sense? So. Mm -hmm. So and it's it's only important it's important because here what what you're seeing here is a fault system and it kind of it's called the Veracruz fault system it jumps over here steps over it's still that same fault system and then it's the Matoka arm here so you actually have and it's a and we'll get into this the types of but it's a strike slip so it's you've got one moving this direction one there so it's more of a horizontal um, fault not not the fault's not necessarily moving up and down it's moving horizontally right i mean it has yeah. some vertical motion too but it's not that this is simplified but all right and this and this is kind of a map showing these little beach balls are basically representing earthquakes and it's just the it's just the the way the fault slipped and different things but um as you can see there are basically two main areas of earthquake activity are like the uh, the beach balls are they sort of like larger yeah, those earthquakes are, on those a bigger are, scale uh yeah well they're actually the the little the red and yellow dots are more of the like size of the earthquakes the, the beach balls are more telling kind of the way the slip direction of the earthquake does that make sense so oh, okay. yeah so um but as you can see at the subduction zone you actually have a lot of earthquakes they're deeper because they're occurring at depth typically, right? Because they've got the one plate going underneath the other one. And so there's, it's, as it slips, as it kind of slips along, you know, and gets subducted, it's, you know, earthquakes are basically a release of pressure. So you get pressure built up and then when it, it snaps, you know, it releases and then you get a motion of the earth. That makes sense. Gotcha. Yep. And then you have this Veracruz fault system, which is a strike slip fault system. And it kind of steps over to this one. So you really have two, fault systems and of course this is important when we're going to talk about okay where would you expect you know a third nephi event to happen right right and the vast majority of it it's it's where that plate is it's on uh the, the west coast here yeah so you have two main ones right and so 
these are more at depth. They're still powerful earthquakes, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily have as much cracking and things. We'll talk about that. But these strike slips actually have a lot more surface features that, uh, you know, cracks and things like that. So this is the Sorensen model. Um, so he basically has land northward up in here. This would be the Veracruz fault system here. And then your land southward down here. This was that step over Matoqua fault here. And then you have the subduction zone along here. And this is uh, Southern Mexico, Northern sort of Guatemala. Yeah. So your Veracruz, yeah, Veracruz is here. Quetzalcoatlcos is here. Guatemala, um, the boundaries somewhere in here. You see Macinta mm -hmm. is a boundary for Guatemala and Mexico. And then you have kind of just, it comes down here. So, and uh, we kind of talked a little bit, you know, about the faults or general structure. Also, you need to look at, when you're looking at the third Nephi event, if it's in a volcanic eruption, which it looks, sounds like part of it is, these are the kinds of what you call, you know, hazards that happen off a volcano. So you have pyroclastic surge, you have debris slides, lahars, which is mud, and we'll talk about it, that comes off if it's, if the, if it's a saturated, uh, an area where there's saturated groundwater, or if it's snow-capped, a volcano, it melts, and so you get this mud that just flows down, and it goes through drainage channels, like river drainage channels, and filling them full of mud. Um, Could you explain yeah. what the word pyroclastic means for those who are here? Yeah, 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 we'll get into that. It's basically, um, pyro is fire, right? like pyromaniacs and <laughs> so i mean pyro means fire plastic would mean like rocks and material and we'll talk about the different kind of volcanoes so a pyroclastic is where you have a like a mount saint helens where it's an explosion that sends out um, a superheated um, basically wall of ash and it also has you know small volcanic little rocks and and tephra in it and it's very fast, meaning it comes out as an explosion. Then, you know, these other, like tsunami, that's obviously not caused by, I mean, it's not the volcano, but if it's adjacent to water, right, you have some shaking or earth movement. Can and earthquakes would contribute to tsunami, tsunamis happening. They, they can too, right? Yeah. And, but, but, but if, let's say, a volcano is located next to, on the coast, right, it could have an eruption because there are earthquakes associated these volcanic earthquakes are not as powerful, but, but it's possible. So and right, you, you, you talk about this later that it couldn't have just been uh, a volcano responsible for all the destruction in 35, but there had to have been an earthquake as well. And you'll probably talk yep. about that later. Yep. Yeah. And so then your lava flows and then you can have, you know, volcanic lightning and thunder. It'll generate its own, uh, essentially because you have so much ash, you know, stirring around, it generates its own static electricity. And that was the picture on the cover of that first slide. Yeah, that so, was really cool. Yeah, that was in Chile. That was a little time lapse. So it wasn't, you know, instantaneous, but you can see that the, the um, we can go back to it if we want, but well, oops. Yeah, you can see. Wow. It's not, yeah, it's not it's not lightning hitting the ground. It's going no. between, you know, it's in the ash cloud. Yeah. So, and and if you notice, Mormon said in the Book of Mormon, it says sharp and sharp lightning. Yeah, lightning and sharp lightnings. Yeah, it was some different kind of lightning, I think, is what it's, you know, they were trying to explain it something a little different than just standard lightning, right? Right, right. And so. And there's a lot of it. It's all sort of like grouped together as well yeah yeah it's well because it's again it's you're just having this massive stirring of ash clouds so somehow it's some's getting positive negative just like static electricity right if you rub right, your right. carpet and touch somebody it's because you're building it up but it's just building up massive amounts of that and then it's just you know discharging this is a pyroclastic flow so um this is the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. It just had a massive ash um, surge. Is this an actual photograph of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. The, you know, it was kind of like the guy taking the picture 
it's like when the bear chases somebody <laughs> you, want, you want somebody else behind you to, for the bear to catch you know so that little <laughs> truck i think is probably probably some geologist that got a little too over i <laughs> know uh, uh, he's rapping like mod to get get the hell out of there <laughs> exactly i don't know for sure but <laughs> So yeah, and so the thing about these is that that's where you get most of your deaths. For example, everybody's heard of you know Pompeii, Herculaneum, the when Vesuvius erupted, right? Mm. That was a pyro, that was a pyroclastic where you had the bodies. They over they had a little bit of warning, so they most of them in Pompeii there weren't too many people, but they got down to Herculaneum, they couldn't get on the boats, and then the ashes overcame them, and then you know then they were sealed in this big thing of ash, and you know then they found their little cavities holes and then they filled them with cement and they were the shape of the bodies you know so right i don't know, I don't know if you've ever been down there but no and, and does the size of the volcano does that matter for how big the eruption is um, or is it not so much about size but like the built up of pressure it's the build up the pressure size being the magma chamber size also makes a difference some some very large volcanoes aren't very active right so they just have smaller volcanoes I mean, they, maybe they had their big eruptions, you know, 500,000 years ago or something. Because right. Some volcano, and we'll talk about that a little bit in terms of the types of volcanoes when we get into that. Okay. Okay. So this is an example of the Lahar flow, which is mud, you know, that came off of the the volcano. So actually, the, the problem with the Lahars is they can go some distance from the volcano, meaning um, just because they're channeling they're going through river channels. So here is a lahar, you know, off of the sand. So the, the volcano is clear over here, right? <laughs> Where they have that little puff of smoke. But this whole river valley filled. And, you know, you can see this bridge here. Not really there anymore. But so so lahars are actually quite dangerous too. Right. And do you say, is that a valley or is that like a river? It, it, it covered it, it, it was, yeah, it was a valley, was. a river. Wow. Yeah, so it just filled it full of rocks and they were just basically debris, volcanic debris. It's still there. You can still see the river now running. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I can see it there. Yeah, but it filled the whole, you know, because the water still kept coming, but it this is after, some time after. It wasn't like the day after the eruption or anything. But Oh, cool. Yeah, but so... Then you can also get whirlwinds after the pyroclastic flows come through because it's obviously heated air. And um, they aren't necessarily super powerful, but and we'll talk about that, what it means when it says whirlwind, the potential meaning. It's not quite like a, a tornado? No, no. I, I mean, it is a tornado in the sense that it's they're smaller. Like a it's mini a tornado? Pulse. Yeah, a larger. Right. most tornadoes are from big, big meteorological systems right and so there's a lot of air movement and then they get us you kind of get a spiral this is basically just after the event you know the pyroclastic flow goes through so they don't necessarily last that long and this is again an example of the lightning well wow. yeah. again you know uh, in ancient people you saw something you know, that's one of the things is, yes, in Mesoamerica, there are volcanoes, but they're actually, I kind of show there hadn't been really many eruptions in that area. So for them. You can understand why, that, why to them it, it, it would just seem all supernatural, like, you know, oh, coming, yeah. coming from God. Yeah. End of the world kind of stuff. You know, yeah. They say. <laughs> and uh, again, that same picture we had before. Wow. This is chilly and chilly. Um. Now I just briefly talk about like the earthquake hazards as we kind of covered a little bit. There are different kinds of faults. Um, a normal fault in the middle is where you have kind of the larger, the wider block of surface going down relative to the smaller, meaning it's shifting down. The reverse is where it goes up. So you get what's called a hanging wall right here. If and why is it called a fault? Did, did you uh, explain that? Uh, fault, I... Well, I don't know where the word technically comes from, but it's it's basically just a crack that moves, you know. So, um, I think it's okay. always that's a good question. I don't I don't think I ever looked. At it. <laughs> <laughs> just something everybody's understood. Okay. Uh, and then the strike slip, like say it's moving sideways, it's not going one side's not going up or one side going down. Oh, I see. 
Yeah. So that's called a strike slip. And if you're, if you're in America, California, like the San Andreas fault, that's more or less a strike slip fault that runs all the way down from okay, go all the way down to lost LA in that area. Ireland, I fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know the geology there. I don't know if there are really many earthquake zones there or not. No, but, no. Yeah, probably. We don't. Safe. We don't get any of that in the in the UK, which is yeah. which is a, a positive. Uh, we we just got uh, steady wet weather. <laughs> Being on an island, yes, yeah, so, it's a very wet climate. Right. So you're fortunate that way. Well, yeah, very fortunate. You know, some areas have every hazard, you know, the hurricanes or oh, tornadoes. Yeah. yeah, that's Mesoamerica, right? I mean, you get hurricanes coming in there. There are tornadoes that occur occasionally in Mesoamerica. You get earthquakes and floods and, you know. Right. <laughs> wasn't it, how was it, uh, what was the island? Was it Haiti a few years back that had the really bad yeah, earthquake? earthquake? Yeah. And there are also volcanoes, you know, through the Caribbean too. So they've got both problems. <laughs> right. Okay. Now the strike slip, as I mentioned, it has all these different so surface features that can happen cracking. So uh, as it moves sideways against the other side, it just puts this stress and tension. And so you have like these horsetail um, type crack systems and fractures. You can also get folds. So you do have some, what you call lift, you know, moving up, moving down. So when it talks about something went up or down in the Book of Mormon, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a horizontal. This type of fault can also generate some of that too. Because it's, again, you're kind of pushing pressure along against the other other plate. And so it kind of wrinkles it. You know, I mean, there's, it's, if, if you're pushing some, if, if you had like two pieces of cloth or something and push them against each other, it'll bunch up. I mean, it's. Right. It's so it's so like raises the groin. So it, makes the makes it higher yeah well so you get kind of these uh yeah some you do get some change in elevation off of a off of these faults and it's also not these are idealized so um usually when people talk about a fault it's not a fault it's a series of cracks right and so you have some cracks can move others are not moving that much but maybe they drop a little bit depending on because it, it's kind of like you got you've got all this ground moving against each other, so you 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 do get surface features. Uh, um, it just changes the face of the land, if you want to call it that. Okay. The other thing, the other thing that happens is you have areas um, in an earthquake where um, certain soil types are subject to what's called liquefaction and lateral spreading. And those are basically soils that are saturated. And what happens is you have a pressure wave from the earthquake hitting, this is very idealized anyway, hitting the material and there's pore spaces and things and it causes the water um, into the, pushes the water, pressurizes it into the pore spaces, which make the material like jello. And so you actually, it's not necessarily the earthquake waves, there are waves going through there, but it's, all of a sudden the soil loses its bearing strength and it becomes like jello. And so like this in Japan, you can see how these, the whole apartment complex is tipped because it's the soil has gotten unstable underneath it. It's not this, I mean, the earthquake is also moving, but, but it's so, and then you get these like spreading. So it, it kind of turns into jello and it kind of spreads out and cracks and they call it lateral spreading on the surface. All right. So it, it turns the, the soil from being, sort of like hard to, to soft like jello yeah right and this can happen some distance off the fault right, right. so it's it's basically it doesn't have to happen right on the fault it's just if the if the pressure and surface waves hit this type of material then it just you know it can be some distance away and certain soils are really subject to it so it doesn't take as much of an impact from the earthquake to do it so it just depends on the soil type and, and this is a result of a, an earthquake not not a not a volcano right. erupting right yeah right, right. so okay. we're still in the we're still talking about the earthquake effects here we kind of gotcha. went so then the question in looking at earthquakes is we obviously don't have 
There's no Nephite geologists that we know of or Lamanite geologists. So they didn't weren't measuring seismicity. <laughs> <laughs> no Jerry Grover of the Nephites. <laughs> right. So, and so you don't have any data, you know, from anything, any of these ancient earthquakes, but you do have descriptions, right? So people have often heard of the Richter scale, right? That's a scale mm -hmm. that when you say, oh, there's a 7.6 earthquake or whatever. Geologists don't typically still use that scale they use something roughly close to it because it's not quite accurate on certain elements but but um it, but and that's where you can measure you have site you have seismographs seismometers measuring the power strength of the earthquake that's in our modern data so we can we can calculate the amount of material that was moved and the power of the earthquake well we don't have that when there's an ancient earthquake but we do have description of destruction right uh, like in these ancient recountings of, of volcanoes. Right. I mean, uh, excuse me, of earthquakes. And so there's what was developed as the Mercalli scale, and it's roughly equivalent to the Richter, and it's in these Roman numerals. So you um, you say, okay, these are the different power of the earthquakes. Um, looking at the Nephite event, because it talked about, you know, destruction of structures, that kind of thing. You're If you look, it, it's really maybe a seven but probably a minimum eight and above right is what, is, that's the level of shaking and so it's based on shaking so disastrous or very disastrous or a catastrophic earthquake right yeah and then you know the, the other ones are well it's slightly you know a three you can kind of fill it a little bit shakes dishes if it's a four so so that way you can take kind of recounting of I mean, the, the reason people care about this is, or geologists, is like typically in an area that may be subject to earthquake damage, they try to do hazard assessments. So you can kind of figure out, okay, what can we project, you know, how big an earthquake will be? Where is it going to affect? Um, how much damage will be done? Right. And so you take kind of, you look at the current geology and, you know, liquefaction and measure the soils, but it's also important that you look for if there's some history, you know, recounting of, of an, an earthquake event so, and the damage. So you can say, oh, okay, there's damage out here. It looked to be like an eight. So you can kind of recreate maybe what an ancient earthquake, the power of an ancient earthquake was. Okay. What I did in the Book of Mormon, I just went through every single and looked at every, uh, basically did a hazard analysis like we would do. To, and because it, it listing all of the different hazards that occurred hazards meaning something that could kill you or destroy stuff right right so, so yeah and this is mostly in in third nephi eight although you have a couple other uh references as well not necessarily yeah. just before when the savior comes to visit the nephites right i did take you know actually looked at the visions you know because there were a couple of visions or prophecies of it happening right so i assumed that they saw something so if they they didn't really see anything that different. You know, it was mostly mists of darkness, so, you know, the shaking, quakings, rocks, rent. But mm -hmm. I didn't include the reference here so that, you know, the prophecy actually included that. I see. Okay. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So, I, yes. I so, he, he, even though they, example, they weren't like, what? Sorry, yeah, Helaman, for example, was probably a prophecy then? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's Samuel Lamanite. So, so basically, okay. you have, I'm, I'm, I'm not true. You basically have these people that observed it at the third Nephi event. I did treat the people that probably saw it in a vision also as observing something, you know. So, okay, I just I tried to be thorough and say, okay, we're accommodating for any type of thing that may have occurred, right? And you've got things exceeding, but I'm going to go into each of those. But you have, um, down the side on oh, sorry, on the last slide, you have exceeding sharp lightnings. The earth yeah. carried up, covered with earth, whirlwinds, great quaking. And there are multiple, yeah, there are multiple pages of this you're not seeing in the book. So ah, uh, yes, a table that goes longer. So, um, and and the point essentially, what I'm trying to do here is is be very thorough. So you need to look at all these things, and I need to be able to explain that yes, that's a geologic event that is explainable, right? So mm. I'm, I'm interesting because. Because growing up, I would have just, uh, I wouldn't have associated all of uh, these descriptions of the dis destruction, uh, these hazards as this is coming from a volcanic eruption or an earthquake. I always would have just presumed it was all uh, supernatural. You know, earthquakes as well, probably 
involved in it. Uh, but it's interesting that you're going to be finding sort of a naturalistic explanation for all of this sort of phenomena that they experienced. Right. And, and it's not, it's not, and it's also typical, even though, you know, again, if you're a faithful believer, you would say, yeah, this is God that's causing all, you know, has precipitated this event, but it is true that, um, he works religious, through science. There are, there are religious beliefs that are based on natural events, you know, that don't have anything to do with God. I mean, meaning, meaning <laughs> I'm not talking about Christian or LDS. I'm just talking about in general, you know, worldwide, you see, you know, the ancient peoples would often interpret um, a natural event in a supernatural way, just like you're saying. Right. So, and the Book of Mormon is no different. I mean, the difference is there were prophecies that this is going to happen. Yes. In a particular time, you know, Christ died. So, so, I mean, even the timing of it is also... I guess I'm miraculous in a way. So, yeah, and, and like Which, the thick, thick ash, vapor of darkness. Maybe we'll talk about this later. But I remember they said that they could can light a torch as well. Um, right. So thick was the darkness, and then sunken cities. So we'll be uh, discussing each of those. Yeah, kind of in brief, and 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 so I, I guess what I'm saying is you have, and there's also some biblical typology going on in the sense that. You know, you have three days of darkness. Christ is in the tomb three days, right? And so, so, so there's also some overtones of biblical things, and, and like, and in this in this book I'm coming up with, I'm showing that actually the 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 eruption occurred on a New Year's Day of the reign of Judges calendar, not of the new calendar. So it actually is a New Year's Day event. In the Hebrew New Late New Year's Day event, they it was basically. Uh, dealing with things from Sinai, right? And so you had God speaking from a cloud. You had shakings and rumblings, and actually the meaning of that cell of that festival or whatever you want to call it, Rosh Hashanah, in the original is like loud destruction. So it's actually there's actually some biblical typology going on as well. Kind of interesting. So that's cool. In the way it's described, right? Okay. Um, one thing is to kind of establish kind of timelines and this will become more important because I also look at the great storm. I look at meteorological. I didn't just limit it to geology. I do look at, um, the hurricane issue. And so we kind of just need a little bit of the timeline because that helps us figure out what has, you know, what parameter will match it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so we know Christ dies. This is from my new book, March 31st, 2080. Even if you don't, take that there's others that have said but it's, it's typically it's a passover right so it's march april time frame so it was when christ died so that's when the we know the destruction at least that's the season it happened in um then you have the three hours where the great storm arose there's some destruction occurring during those throughout the three hours um after the storm and those initial destructive forces there was a darkening face of the land for three days um we just know many hours before the end of the three days a summary of destruction of the various cities was provided so the question is well you may have had the cities destroyed initially but it's possible maybe some of them were destroyed over the more of the two to three day time frame so and then during that three-day period they it also mentions kind of at the end it said that these things ended so that it talks about trembling of the earth rending of the rocks groanings tumultuous noises so there there was something occurring beyond the three hours right the full three days not just the mist of darkness or other things going on i mean maybe they couldn't see very much <laughs> but but they there was which the point is here as we get into it is is it does match what you would expect from like a volcanic eruption, right? It erupted. And then you were maybe having these ongoing continuous eruption, which is mm. one reason why you still had ash, right? It was still generating ash for the three days. Also earthquakes, you know, typically you have some main hits and then you have aftershocks, right? Um, right. It's, it's typical for a, an earthquake event. So so it's basically and, and with that, the with the ash, uh, I I don't know if you have a slide in this, but I'll just ask the question. Now. Would it have been like complete uh, darkness? And uh, is there other examples of this happening when a volcano yeah. erupts that 
the the ash is is so thick in the sky that people aren't able to see it's just dark yeah it just surrounds them i mean uh, clearly when you're looking at this event you're saying okay there's probably nephi right the prophet at the time compiling this information but well they didn't have like google earth right they're not so they're not seeing all, all they can go is what's reported on the ground you know and a lot of people were killed so it's they're it doesn't mean that the ash covered every mountain top, right, or something like that. But just to them, it was the face of the land as they all that they could, could see, see was it was everywhere that people were, who were reporting, because obviously they had to gather information after the fact, and you know, and and I mean, Christ told them that certain cities were destroyed, but a lot of the people in those cities, maybe they were most of them dead, right? So, um, I mean, I, so. so so essentially, I'm not, and that's the thing you have to recognize. It's it, it's not like covering every square meter of, of ground. I mean, it's an ancient, it's a reporting from ancient people who um, are compiling a story or you know a description of the event the best they could. Also, as they interpret it, yeah, and it's pretty. Crazy. It's also clear that he. I'm not, you know, that the there are constructing the um narrative to match make sure that the prophecies they're 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 sure to, they're they're including everything that the prophecies indicated would happen does that make sense what I'm saying? right so, to yeah, fulfill yeah. prophecy as well right and so, and so there may be other things they're not describing but they're but they're basically describing all the things that clearly the prophecy described uh, maybe a few other things like vapors overcoming people or something and so this darkness they're basically saying yes there was this darkness it was and it's it's it really is it's just it's you're surrounded by ash people are choking um and you saw that pyroclastic flow for example i mean that that's the ash i mean it's coming out as superheated but but in the atmosphere as that settles that's that kind of material that just darkens you know right because because i don't know if you have a slide on this or not if you do we can save it for later but do you have a slide where it talked about they tried to light uh, a torch but they, they couldn't light it um i think maybe i just have a general discussion of that it's in the book let me see if i've yeah well and that's the kind of the explanation there there's two potential probably one likely meaning you can have gases come out of volcanoes volcanic eruptions and so you can have carbon dioxide which you can't burn anything right if you're but the reality is, is that kills everybody any you know being the least of their concerns is lighting it because they'd be dead. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that was one of my yeah, questions because yeah, if, so if they couldn't just... light a torch, uh, say it was the gas in the air, how were they able to yeah, breathe? So, so that that's, you know, some people say that, but the the ac more accurate is the ash, it settles on the, on the wood. I mean, you can't burn things that are covered with ash. It's silica, right? It's not, uh, it's difficult to get things to burn because it's just like, you know, when you, it's like having dirt all over your fuel. It doesn't burn very well. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and so and it's just it's just covering everything. It's coating everything. It's you know you got three or four. So that would be the more likely explanation of the gases in the air, but the ash on on the yeah. wood. Yeah. It difficult yeah. To I, know, so, it. I know you had another podcast where they they kind of made fun. It was like no, that's not that that that's one. Maybe that happened where you had enough carbon dioxide or something where they couldn't light it but it didn't kill them kind of thing but that i i don't think that's really what it's talking about it's talking about the ash because it's talking about the mist of darkness really when it mentions that so right yeah okay just wanted to to clarify that okay yeah. and and the other thing it's it's like the the way it's described is is there you know it was it was such it wasn't drying out the wood or something like that um some people say, well, also because it was generating the the volcano can generate storms and precipitation, which it does. And that may be part of it too. Maybe it was like raining mud. Right. You know, uh, and so that's possible too. So you said people probably would have been choking, you know, with all of the ash, but there still would have been some oxygen in the air for people to Yeah, still... well, choking is just the dust, right? So so you're yeah. just breathing in it's like if you do motocross or something like that, you know, yeah. you're, 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 or you're behind somebody that's driving on a dirt road, you know, you're choking from the dirt. I mean, but ash is way, you know, it's much worse and it gets in your lungs and they're obviously covering their face with cloth. I mean, obviously we're not just sitting there breathing it. They're probably trying to block it and that, but right. Right. But it is ash. You know, you do get killed by ash, like in 
in Herculeum and Pompeii. They just got overcome by the ash. Gotcha. Alrighty. So, so one thing I looked at was there's also the question, could the great storm, because it talks about a great storm, right? That's the initially for the first three hours. And so some people say, well, could it have been a hurricane? I looked at that. I looked at every hurricane that was tracked since 1842. All these weird little lines are and they change colors when they're going from tropical storm to hurricane. You know how Ireland, you don't get hurricanes either, I guess. But um, <laughs> but essentially, a hurricane. You don't starts get anything. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, you basically have a tropical storm that then goes to a hurricane one, hurricane two. You know, so you usually get a strengthening or weakening. So the the different colors is just basically what what it was that went through. Whether you know, so and I actually have a legend in the book, but but one of the, the key thing is is that you. The, what is, the point it's trying to make two things is you don't get hurricanes that early march april typically very rare so it doesn't seem like it was probably a hurricane based on that scientific parameter the second thing is hurricanes um if you're looking at a three-day event um or a three hour event, you know, as the great storm. So the great storm lasted three hours. That has to be a very fast hurricane, but very fast hurricanes typically aren't that powerful. Not because, strong, right? Yeah. Cause they, they get their strength by sitting over warm water and getting, you know, getting all this moisture and then they dump it. And then they, you know, they get these huge vortexes, you know, around the hurricane. So, so it, um, and the other thing is I'm looking at, do you actually have, is, is a hurricane necessary to explain all of the things in the third Nephi event? And it's not, meaning I kind of say that you don't need a hurricane to explain that. You can explain that with a volcano and an earthquake system. So could there have been a hurricane? Well, I'm not saying there necessarily wasn't, but it'd been extremely rare and it, you don't necessarily, it doesn't. And, and there's actually, I get into the book, there's, there's not really an evidence of, there is some way to, at least on the Yucatan, you can look at beach things to try to figure out if there was a hurricane, like a surge, how the, how, how the sea surges up, you know, when you have a hurricane goes, and it, there wasn't anything happening in the right time frame there. Right. So, All right, so no, no plausible strong case for a hurricane right in that type of location i mean it's not again it's plausible i can't rule it out completely but it's i'm just saying but you say it's it's not necessary you don't you don't need it to to make yeah. all the destruction all the uh hazards and descriptions uh right possible you don't need a hurricane yeah and, that, and that's the point of this analysis try to narrow it down and kind of say okay look at this more in detail on the ground you know um okay. you know you know if you're if your model is in the Malay Peninsula or, you know, the Baja Peninsula or something, well, you probably don't have to do much of a hurricane analysis. I mean, they get hurricanes occasionally through there, but here in Mesoamerica, that is an event that occurs. So I needed to look at it. Um, the other thing, and you hear this from people that don't subscribe to the Mesoamerica model, they say, well, it doesn't say volcano, you know, in the Book of Mormon. It I think I've heard said, that. Yeah, it's called, you know, they call it a great storm. But basically, there are no volcanoes in Israel. And there's no known word for a volcano in biblical Hebrew or in Egyptian. So great storm is a likely term that you would have found to describe the event. Um, I kind of go into like, even in the Bible, like Ezekiel's vision, you know, he was in prison he was looking north and he saw all these things some of those things look like a volcanic almost like he's seen some sort of volcanic eruption um and that was translated as a storm right and so so there are we don't really have great examples in the bible of witnessing a volcanic eruption but that might right. be one. that might be one and they use the word storm you know so so i'm looking to the bible saying is there anything showing there the other interesting thing is the tower of Sherazah which is in one of the epistles that Mormon, you know, that Mor Moroni included in his books of, that Mormon wrote. And it was involving, you know, when Zen Zenify, um, you know, the people were wandering, they were imprisoned in the tower. Um, and, but the interesting thing is that biblical, that's a biblical 
name that comes from Sherazer, which is not a Hebrew um, word. It's a, it's a Hebrew word borrowed into the Bible. It's from Zend, the language of Zend, which is over in Persia. And it means Prince of Fire. And um, so I do think that is a reference to a volcano in the Book of Mormon because the god in, of volcanoes in Mesoamerica is the Prince of Fire, the young king of fire. So I, I do think that that and that, I do think that is the actual volcano that erupted too that they're talking about. But so and, and just to clarify, so I'm not misunderstanding the tar of Shereza, that's that's a latter Mormon writing to Moroni. And yeah, he's that, talking. Yeah, yeah, he's not talking about it's later. So it's basically when they after. were in, the battle, in these battle sequences. And he said, you know, it was when he was, it was a different battlefront because he was, he was talking about the Xenophi went and took all the provisions and left these the women and children without anything. Um, the, the Lamanites were betwixt him and them. I mean, he couldn't get over there. But he mentions that there's this tower of Sherazza, you know, is the land of Sherazza. So what I'm saying is that's a geographical um, feature, right? He's talking about people say it's this tower. Well, that's not, if you know, Mesoamerica towers are really big mounds, you know, and they, they actually modeled in the cities. They would look at the volcano and build their, the pyramids actually modeling the volcanoes that are in the distance, you know, mm. So, 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 so of, you're you're saying that that would be a reference, do you believe, to a volcano? Yeah, right. So, because tower in Hebrew is also could be a hill, big hill. Um, so it could be something, hmm. and, and it could it could have been a tower on it, you know, some structure on the on the top of the volcano or something. But I do think it it actually it, geographically the terminology fits for uh, to describe a volcano and the okay. name of the, the name of the volcano. Yeah, so. Because that's kind of the, like, well, do they, and then the interesting thing, man, I don't remember if I put it here in the, let's see. Yeah, but the other thing is um, I did identify probably the San Martin um, eruption. And the interesting thing is that erupted in the 1700s. And it was that volcano is consistently cloud covered because the Tuxla mountain range is like one of the wettest precipitation areas, you know, and not necessarily the world, but at least in the Americas. And so um, when that erupted, um, it's also a very noisy volcano, which, you know, they're tumultuous noises. They described it, the locals described it because they couldn't see the volcano. It was just this, they called it a great storm. They, called, they used the exact term. <laughs> that you find in the book of mormon that's interesting because they could yeah they couldn't see that it was a volcano that, that yeah, they didn't know what was caused it yeah actually the the locals they came it was they heard all these booming you know and it was at night just boom 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 because that the san martin volcano is very noisy it's freato magmatic meaning you have all this groundwater so it gets heated and it just turns to steam and blow you know you have these explosions occurring shallow underground of the heated groundwater you know just pressurized water and so it was just boom 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 and they thought it was an attack of pirates on the port of veracruz <laughs> so they yeah so they ran down to the port thinking that the pirates were attacking the port <laughs> when in fact it was just the volcano you know these loud noises meaning they didn't necessarily connect it yeah they didn't associate the, the noise with oh this is a volcano right and it was also at night too and so you know, and from what we know, the um, the volcano in the Book of Mormon would have erupted early morning, not necessarily at night, but maybe it was. But I guess what I'm saying is you do, people are looking for the word volcano. Well, it's like, you're not going to find it. Nobody would expect to find that in the Egyptian or the Hebrew. Right. Um, and so, but great storm is something you would expect to use to describe it. And that's the way it was described by the people, local people in the 1700s when it erupted i do think the shares are gives you another argument that yes you're talking about a volcano because that's the you know the that's the, the name for that tower whatever is prince of fire that's the lord of fire is 
how they refer to volcanoes, the god of volcanoes, you know, in Mesoamerica. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? So yeah. So sort of your argument is that even though the Book of Mormon might just refer to it as a great storm, you're saying that we know of a volcano erupted, uh, the San Martin uh, volcano in 1793, but the peoples there also just described it as a great storm. Right. That doesn't mean it's it's not a volcano. Yeah. And, and you have to understand too, they're not sitting down okay, was this a strike slip fault system that went off? Is this a, you know, pyroclastic flow? <laughs> yeah. They just, they just have this catastrophic event from God. I mean, that's, they don't, you know, I think they had some familiarity with volcanoes, so it wasn't, but and that's why I described it, something, the destruction they had never seen before. They had maybe seen some volcanic eruption, and, and then I get into it, but what they, also what they hadn't seen was a simultaneous regional earthquake along with the volcano right so that, that's one reason why it was destruction like they'd never seen before and so and we'll go into that yeah okay um so the question is could a volcano alone so so again we're looking at this hazard and i'm, I'm kind of the question is can you just have a volcano will that handle all of what's described in third nephi right all of the hazards and the problem is is volcanic eruptions you know unless they're on the level of like santorini where the whole island is exploded you know i mean there are some huge ones but in that case everybody's killed i mean there's no there's it's so destructive you don't have any survivors or anything in a meeting but but the most volcano i mean they they monitored volcanoes for years and years and the largest recorded that they had again this is not we don't know what santorini was that was back you know in the greek times but as the highest is a magnitude seven and then they typically they don't extend very far from the volcano number one power of earthquake is how much earth is getting moved so like a really powerful earthquake you're moving miles and miles of material shifting it right whereas a volcano it's explosive but you're it moves a large amount of material. I'm not saying it does it. It's half a mountain, but compared to an earthquake, the total volume, you know, of shifting is so it's it's actually has less power than than large earthquakes have. That does that make sense? What I'm saying. So yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, and so and then this equation, which you know, there's no exam at the end of this presentation. But, uh, <laughs> but, there's, <laughs> but there's an equation that was developed to tell you the intensity of, and this is kind of important in the sense that, that how, how far away from the volcano you are, um, there's an intensity, you can kind of calculate what the intensity would be the distance away from it. So of an earthquake, of a volcanic earthquake. So, uh, and that's kind of important as we get to like the prison events, because it said there was a shaking, the prison wall, you know, one event that it collapsed, the other one, it didn't. And so you can say, okay, I know the intensity on this Mer Mercalli scale. I can basically back calculate and see how far away the volcano probably was. If there was, if it was a volcanic earthquake, does that make sense? What I'm saying. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Uh, and, and so there were in the Alma one, there were no, all that was talked about was a great sound, but it wasn't, there was no smoke or anything, but then the other event, it talked about a cloud coming down, it shook, cloud came down, it shook. That would be a typical. So I'm saying that sounds just like a volcanic. There's a volcano erupt, some sort of small volcanic eruption and some earthquakes occurring. That probably is a volcanic earthquake. Gotcha for that. Not the, not that the 30, not not from the 30 35. Five. Right. Yeah, but that's one reason I'm going through this here is because we're going to apply this to the other events too. Okay. These are what's called shake. So that, that, and I kind of show here, these are um, earthquakes that were of this seven, not, these are not volcanic earthquakes, but I'm trying to show if you have a level of seven, what, you know, what extent do you have? These are called shake maps that are after an earthquake, they kind of look at the strength and the area they affect. And it's kind of showing that, when you have a, a seven earthquake, like a volcano would be, you don't, it's not affecting large area. You know, you're kind of, it's, 
It's, and so it's basically showing that, yeah, a volcanic earthquake, you got to have a lot larger extent, uh, a lot uh, uh, earthquake because you had damage in the land southward. And it said most of the damage is in the land northward, but you have to have quaking damage in both. Does that make sense? Or, you know, extending to both. Right. Yeah. So and it's so quite, I'm a, saying if not, quite a large geographical area that, that right. the earthquake would have to be covering. Yeah. And so this shows, okay, the, the maximum volcano, volcanic earthquakes are sevens. These are sevens. And you can see the extent is not that. Not, not that far. Right. And so uh, again, I'm kind of telling you that, yes, you cannot just have a, a volcano alone. I mean, you could have multiple volcanoes. I'll talk about that. But really what you're looking at is you have, it's a regional fault system. And the reason this is important is because then we can say, okay, we know where there are volcanoes. I can look at the data and figure out which ones erupted during the right time frame. And we're looking for a volcano that's on a fault because, or adjacent to a fault, because we'll talk about that, because there have been, it is known that you have, that earthquake can trigger volcanic eruptions, especially the volcano hasn't erupted for some time. It has a mag magnet chamber under pressure that the earthquake can actually simultaneously cause the eruption of the volcano. Okay, so, so maybe I'm jumping ahead, but are you thinking uh, the earthquake might have been the thing that triggered the volcanic eruption rather than... Yeah. It well, because you, you, you had to have both occurring in that three-hour period, right? So you had this great uh, storm, yeah. you had the great cake, and then, again, I'm saying you don't, it, there is some room for some of the cities being destroyed in the three-day period, not necessarily in the first three hours, because it talks about additional quaking and aftershocks, but but really that first three-hour event, it talks about quakings and volcano and the destruction, so. Right, and, and you're saying a volcanic earthquake, it wouldn't have covered the the geographical uh, area that it would need to would have to have been a a, a large earthquake yeah right earthquake. I mean obviously the people next to the volcano yes they did get the volcanic earthquake and that was bad too but but in order to get again we're trying to take the all of the thirty five parameters and make sure that they I explain them all and whatever we come up with has to accommodate everything yes I mean I don't cherry pick right so oh, that's important. So then the question is, is there such a thing as a simultaneous regional earthquake and volcano, you know, volcanic eruption? And yes, they do occur. There was a study that showed um, basically what um, kind of conditions you look for, um, for that to occur. And um, basically there's a high correlation with the specific ring of fire, which Mesoamerica is part of. Um, you do, it does, the most common is that the volcano needs to be near, very near the earthquake or fault, which obviously is intuitive, right? You've got to have sufficient. And as we'll see, that's why the San Martin is, is probably the best candidate. But the other thing you look for is that before the earthquake, there's less volcanic activity, meaning that the volcano is maybe primed or getting close to erupting, right? So the, the earthquake didn't cause all of the magma to move, but it caused enough shaking that the pressure, you know, th that the magma somehow got released, you know, it was, it was already under pressure. So you're just kind of pushing it and it explodes. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so then I have to say, okay, I have two fault systems that I have to look at. Remember in, earlier on in the presentation, I said, there's this subduction zone. And then there's this strike slip fault, the Veracruz fault system. Yeah. Now, again, another equation <laughs> is um, <laughs> I've I've no idea uh, how to solve that. <laughs> yeah, what, or what it means. Right. Yeah. And again, I'm just what I'm trying to get at here is scientific that that they're. I, I should present that to my primary school children and be like, solve this. <laughs> yeah, they probably would say, oh, that's A B C D E F G something like that. <laughs> But, but it's not to solve, it's kind of, and I don't expect, it's basically, but I had to get an equation, and it's in the book. So what I had to do was earthquakes, they, and this is just intuitive, everybody knows it. I mean, as you get further away from the fault, the shaking and damage gets less, right? Right. Unless you're in one of these zones of where I talked about of liquefaction, where you basically 
So you may have, you know, the earthquake, then you have some bedrock where it's not as effective. You know, the wave travels through there, but it's not shaking a lot. It hits that, turns something to jello, and then you have more destruction, more buildings mm. collapsing. Does that make sense? So, so yeah, yeah. But 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 what we're trying to do here is it's called attenuation factors. So and these are developed, these equations are developed typically, you know, they're more developed in developed countries that have more money and more data. So like the San Andreas Fault in California, they've got really good equations to tell you what the damage is as you get further away, what we'd expect further away from the fault. And it, it, it just, it's dependent on rock type and some other things, but it's also, you know, just over distance, they decrease in power, right? So, right. So we also, that's also helpful for us to maybe identify where some of these cities may have been, right? Uh, because there are a bunch of cities in Third Nephi, we don't have any other reference to them anywhere else. So, this in looking at as I apply this parameter to the Sorensen model, I may be able to improve the model if it actually matches. Meaning, I could maybe identify where these cities might have been located um, applying this geologic parameter. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Yeah. So if it's like uh, it, I'm saying, okay, if it's talking about the city got destroyed or collapsed or whatever. And it's not near the volcano. It's got to be some distance away from the fault. It can't be like, you know, it's got to be within the zone where you'd expect that kind of destruction to occur. So yeah, so you can, you can see if if the geography matches um, with what we know about the geological activity, yeah. and what would have happened to those locations, right? And so, but some like Bountiful, you know, that wasn't destroyed, but adjacent to it looks like it was. They looked across the river and saw this destruction, you know, mm. and, and so. So there are certain cities that we do have that people are going to have in their models, like Zarahemla, Bountiful. And so then we can test and say, okay, does and then we'll get into Ammonia. It's not part of the third Nephi event, but that's another one where you have, you've got to have a fault system, right? Because it talked about an earthquake. So if somebody has Ammonia sitting in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula, which is like super, it's like Ireland, basically, <laughs> no earthquakes. That would be a problem. Yes, exactly. It's like, then that, that's a defect in your model. You need to correct. Or, for, or for example, if um, uh, you're looking at uh, geology, if so bountiful in 35 count was spared from the destruction, but had, you know, you looked at the model and actually find, no, no, this would have, uh, you know, been impacted by it, then that would, that would pose a problem for the Mesoamerican model if that well it would it would have to be you have to have a situation where you have bountiful surviving but not too far away a lot of destruction mm -hmm. so that's that's a, that's kind of a unique situation some people interpret it to say oh they were just talking about the wickedness of the people or something you know the great destruction <laughs> but you know i mean some people just try to interpret the text to get out of those things but basically so that that's a situation where you're saying okay that's kind of a unique thing right quite specific as well yeah. So, and, and and that would be a city because there's other references to it, land of bountiful, meaning most people will have that city in their model because it's mentioned other places, right? Where some of the cities mentioned at the third Nephi destruction is like, well, they just, <laughs> that's the only time they're mentioned. They got destroyed, um, you know, and you can maybe some of the names you can, well, and I kind of, Actually, one of the books is like Josh, you know, actually, I don't go into that it means fire, you know, so in Hebrew. So actually, probably the city got named because it got destroyed by fire. <laughs> and after there's a lot of after the fact naming going on in the Book of Mormon, they call it metonymic, right? So the name actually. So the name might have been later, like attributed to it, but it wasn't, didn't maybe have that name at the time. Exactly. And individuals the same. You know, it's like oh, layman. Okay. layman means unbeliever. So, like, do you think did he name his kid unbeliever? You know, I. <laughs> like, <laughs> it may be as some derivative or some funky little pun. You know, I'm not saying there wasn't some basis, but actually, it looks like most of the names in the Book of Mormon are metonymic, meaning they're describing the person, which mm -hmm. is in the Bible too. You know, Jacob, yeah, Israel, right? Because I think Nephi in Egyptian kind of means like fair and and good. Mm -hmm. as well yep. like we won the meanings and and he uses that uh those phrasing a lot in his account yeah and actually uh, we're not going to get into this but like in the characters document actually the form of the ne nephi is a cross and, and 
and protector in Egyptian is that form. And Nephi is called a protector in one of the chapters of oh, okay. the protector of the people. Right. And so, so there's actually taking the glyph form and maybe there's multiple meanings, but we know this just looking at the original text in the sense that you don't have a first Nephi, you don't have a second Nephi, you don't have a third Nephi, you don't have a fourth Nephi. They're all just titled book of Nephi in the original text. In the original manuscript. Yes, that was all added after they numbered them. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so you know that there's a different glyph form going on here. So, you meaning that there's they're called Nephi, but the glyph for them is maybe phonetically the same, but it's different um, underneath. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? There's sort of like differentiate like, between them somehow. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like like my name's Jerry, right? But you can spell it G E R I. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, right. I got you. Yeah, Stephen V P H. You know, so so I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's basically saying you can have the same phonetic, but have some under, but what is underlying it in the language is different. Gotcha. So okay, that's kind of a, a deviation. Jerry, do you mind if I just pause for one second and get a little drink? Yeah, that's good. Uh, pop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and as I mentioned, so you kind of have this equation that will tell you the distance. This was one Mexico, Southern Mexico didn't have a very good one. I mean, didn't, I mean, in the area that we're looking at the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, I just did use one that was in Southern Mexico and modified it a little bit um, to give us the equation that we're now going to see the results up here, in the next slide. So basically what I did is laying in that attenuation and we're looking for from a zone from seven to up to 11, 11 is bad, but at least a minimum seven. It's got to be in that zone to get the damage you're talking about in the Book of Mormon. Remember in the Mercalli scale, we said for like building collapse and what's described. So essentially the only, the areas that you would have where that could happen, um, there may be, you know, a few um, earthquakes that occur occasionally off of this attenuation zone and smaller faults, but so basically, these are the two fault systems that I'm I'm going to have where you're if you're looking at a Mesoamerican model like the Sorensen model, that's where you would expect the these cities to reside that got that kind of damage. And actually, importantly, because we're looking for a volcano along the fault system, mm -hmm. so the, the subduction zone is not really a good candidate. It's mostly offshore is where you're getting the big because um, it's closer to the you know where the trench is over here yeah and so if you're look so the veracruz fault system looks to be the better candidate right okay okay because yeah the the land north would be over here and a lot of the the main cities like bountiful and such would be in this sort of region yeah. i'm remembering right. Like. right so you have narrow neck bountiful as you know it borders desolation Sorensen has bountiful over here and we'll talk about that this is uh, in the Sorensen model. I can't even, can I see where this, you know, kind of Zarahemla down in here. Oh, yes, Landa Nephi. Yeah, or you're on here somewhere. And there is this fault here, which also could have uh, also, you know, moved as well. It's kind of a step over fault. But I just looked at the Veracruz um, because most, it says most of the damage is in the land northward. That's what the Book of Mormon says. So that's where I'm, I need to have a fault system and a volcano in the land northward. Gotcha. So then I looked at all of the volcanoes all through Mesoamerica, which took a lot of time as, I bet. Was, as to when they erupted if with the topper with the proper time frames. And in the land northward, there were only three that really qualified. Again, it's good, as good as the data is out there, meaning not all these volcanoes have been completely mapped and dated as to every eruption. But um, and so there, there were basically three for the land northward. There is the El Chicon, which is kind of you know kind of your boundary land northward somewhere. There's different. I have my own theory, but so it's not right in the land northward, but it's at least centrally located. Because the other thing you have to have is you got to have the, the, the mist of darkness does cover the land southward and the land northward. Mm. So, so that was one of the issues. If you get these other, the, these ones that are 
um, these are the Pico de Orizaba. These are the ones further to the north. They're up in here. And then you have San Martin. So, so if you get too far north, it becomes again, this is a plausibility issue. It becomes a little more less plausible that you're going to cover all the land southward down here, but with ash. Right. Okay. Because it's interesting. I think whenever I um, did one of my videos on archaeological evidence and I took from the Book of Mormon Central article, I think if I'm not mis misremembering that uh, they pointed to the, how do you pronounce it? Poco, Poco Patel volcano. Uh, Poco Catapetal Poco up by Mexico City. Yeah. As being probably a likely candidate, but you're saying that it's probably too far north. Well, yeah, that, the reason is is because some of them put the land northward up into, which it talks about that they went very far to the north, right? And then there was one migration to the land of many water lakes. That The theory is that is probably the Valley of Mexico because at the time it was a big lake, right? I mean, and so some people say, well, okay. And I'm not saying that maybe that, Maybe that also erupted. I mean, we can talk about it. It, it has been known for two two volcanoes to erupt at the same time, Kamchatka Peninsula. So, um, but I don't think if it was just that one, it's too far north. To right. Really, so it's not the really, best candidate. Right. The I, I, again, I'm saying, hey, I'm trying to meet all the parameters, and 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 it may be, yeah. It's, it's a statistical certainty kind of thing. It's like 85%. I mean, could it have been that one and just had a lot, you know, a big, huge wind rolling it all the way south, I suppose, but um, it's not the most plausible. So okay. then we get to, okay, so I, we, we know we're looking at the Veracruz fault system um, and just kind of showing a little more detail of the fault. Um, and the important thing is, you know, kind of where it runs specifically we're looking at right here that's the san martin that's the volcanic field where the san martin volcano sits and remember you know the best candidate is one if we're, we have to have both the earthquake regional earthquake and a volcano and the volcano one of the parameters is it's got to sit on or near a fault in order to erupt simultaneously and, oh, okay and here we have not only is the volcano in the field, the structure of the volcano follows the fault system. So the magma is coming up along fault traces or fault, it, meaning it's dictating to some extent the way the magma is coming up, right? So if you have an earthquake through here, it's probably going to be right in the magma chamber. You're going to be actually you would expect it to directly impact the mag the volcano. So it's actually a perfect candidate for what we're talking about. Already. So, okay. And again, these are just, you know, you can look at it. It's, it's mostly just show, these are the fault, you know, kind of the fault system. And then this is the volcanic field. That, the and the, the little red triangles, that's quaternary volcanic vents. Vents, yeah, those are, they're just mapped in the, the little vent, you know, but this is the volcano right here, the main volcano. Vents can be all over the volcano, just where it's, you know, got fumaroles or steam or something has come out. Quaternary is like more recent geologic time, but it's still, it's not thousands of years. It's, you know, hundreds of thousands of million years. So. Uh, and can you just circle with your mouse where exactly the volcano is? It's right, in, it's right here. Oh, right in there. Okay. Yep. And in the, in the Book of Mormon models, the like the a lot of them have Teal Camorra over here, so it's definitely like land northward, you know. Mm -hmm. So I say it's the best candidate. It's also centrally located for the mist of darkness. It has this particular volcano has extremely loud eruptions. These phreatomagmatic, which is consistent with the tumultuous noises. They're trying to describe. Um, you know, how, how would you get that? Yes, earthquakes can make sounds, but you're looking for a volcano. And it happened for the full three days. It talks about tumultuous noises all along. So you're looking for a volcano that's going to be generating these sounds over a three-day period, which the San Martin fits. Right. And it's, and it's right on the fault system. So, and it erupted in the right time frame. Right, and it's, it's in the best location 
as well. Like you said, centrally between land northward, land southward, uh, along the fault system. Okay. Yeah. And that's a picture of the volcano. So, and here is what I did here is in the 1792 93 eruption, there was a, a naturalist came over from Spain afterward and he interviewed, he was trying to figure out where it all affected. And so, this is the extent of the ash cloud that came out of that eruption. Now, I just drew an ellipse. It's not, we don't, <laughs> it probably wasn't like that. It was, you know, stag, you know, kind of follow the storms or wind wind patterns. I didn't really do that. But, and this is where they actually found the ash in a marsh of that eruption. So there's scientific. And as you can see, the San Martin, this is your land northward. Yeah, the land southward gets down in here, but it, it's that, that it's, it's located in such a way that I think that could cover both. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily require um, a huge eruption to do that. This was not, they measure eruptions in, they call them VEI, Volcanic Explosivity Index. Some people are looking for a huge, you know, eruption because, well, you know, it describes a bad event, but you don't need that huge of a description of, a, of an eruption um, to cover all of the, with the ash cloud from the San Martin. So it, it, you don't have to look for some, something like they have these ice cores on the Arctic. It, it, it was not necessarily an eruption that would show up there as being this huge, you know, eruption. So. I don't know if you're going to mention this, but with the eruption that happened, um, you know, in, in the first century AD, would that have been comparable to the one in 1793? Or do you think it would have been a, a much larger uh, eruption? It was a little different kind of eruption. I think that eruption, I think, was probably a little more powerful. Meaning, probably the way that they describe the, you know, the the cities burning, you know, fire from the sky. I, I do think there was probably more destruction local to the. I, I mean, there is ash that we we know. That there's a city, Tres Apotes, up over here. That um, the there's a stele that's dated at 31 BC that's covered with ash. So. So we know that eruption, you know, went that far and, and probably, you know, had like, I don't know, six inches of ash or something like that. I mean, there was a significant amount of damage. So I do think it was probably maybe a little bigger than that, but there's not enough data to really say that. Okay. Now, the other thing we look at too is, is this, um, the augmentation. We talked about this liquefaction. And so when you have an earthquake, if the soil is such a way it add, I, I mean, the way I've done this and I kind of had to do this myself, there weren't any models down there, but I went through the different soil types based on the geologic maps. And so what happens is when you have these soils that are sub, um, subject to this liquefaction, what I did is, is these different colors. If it's like this um, red, that would mean if you have like a Mercalli seven, you, of the earthquake you could add 2.4 to that in that particular area and so, so it's like the earthquake seven. is more intense in those areas yeah, so, you, so you'd have a 9.4 damage instead of a seven does um, that make sense so yeah it accentuates the damage the damage level and so you and so this would this orangey stuff would be like a 1.6 add, add 1.6 more points to your mercalli scale right that's all about the soil type Right. And so this is the interesting thing. This is where Sorensen has Bountiful, which is not, Bountiful sits not in an area where you'd get that effect. But right, right beside the, a couple areas. Right across the river, you get the worst. And so you could, let's say, you know, because, and this is kind of just, it's on the margin. So Bountiful probably got some damage. I mean, it wasn't like it was nothing, but the temple was intact and things were intact, but so it's on a very stable bedrock, but right adjacent, right across the river. And we know there's a river at Bountiful because they went and baptized, you know, people and stuff. So, so actually, so I would say looking at this, the Sorensen model is like a perfect, you know, you've got Bountiful in the exact kind of situation that meets the geologic parameter of the description of the text. Does that make sense? And what would the soil have been um, in Bountiful different to these ones? It's just, it's just normal, meaning it, it's not, it's not subject to liquefaction. I mean, it's not, it's not a type of soil that, that would be any different. Right. I mean, 
Yeah. So, so these are the bad. So, so it's basically, you're adding three levels of intensity almost on the Mercalli scale, which is a huge amount, you know, of damage. And so it's, this would be just like kind of your normal bedrock. Um, mm. And then across the river, you've got this. So is Bountiful that location? Can we say for sure? Well, no, I don't know that we can say for sure, but where Sorensen has it, it does meet the criteria of the text. That you have right. Bountiful located on a more stable location and immediately adjacent to it, something where you would expect more destruction, a higher level, a much higher level of destruction than occurred in Bountiful. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so this would be an element where the geology would corroborate and support his uh, geographical model for the location yeah. of these different cities. Right. Now, can he put it somewhere else? Well, maybe, but I'm just saying, I'm not saying exactly where they're, I'm just testing people's models here. So this is testing the Sorensen model. Gotcha. And that's what I'm saying everybody needs to do. If they're doing it in a model, they need to look at these details and they've got to be able to explain Bountiful, why, you know, what, what happened there. So, mm -hmm. oops. So, um, so I've kind of just a summary of the best fit is what I'm calling it. Um, so these are basically saying that all the things, all the hazards we talked about can all be just accounted for with volcanic eruption and a regional earthquake. That's all you need to get the destruction that's occurring in third Nephi. And the, and the thunderings, the whirlwinds, the sharp lightnings that would all follow the volcanic eruption. Yep. Right. And actually when you're looking for whirlwinds, I mean, if you saw that pyroclastic flow, you're getting even that could have been the whirlwind they're talking about just this huge you know superheated ash you know coming through and because it will pick up stuff it's not it's a, it's like a huge wind you know so but so I, again the goal here was to say okay yeah we can describe everything there with these parameters so we know there needs to be a regional earthquake we know there's a volcano it explains everything and so then then i start to get to each of the cities Again, we're not so now we're we're testing the Sorensen model. We've got a general test of northward and everything. You know, we're we've got a volcano that fits in the right location. It's on a fault. So, um, I meaning so far his model has worked pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. in terms of, but now we're getting down to the specific city. So we talked about Bountiful, Moroni Ha. He doesn't really. He's not quite sure where it is. He just said it's probably in this general area based on where Moronaha was operating uh, militarily. So he thought, well, maybe they named it after this general area down here. Um, so, and it, it said the earth was carried up in the place of the city there became a great mountain. That's kind of an interesting geologic phenomenon. Where can you hmm. get that? I mean, people said, well, how do you get that? Well, you can get, you know, these earthquakes trigger large landslides. In fact, in 2007, in Grijalva River, you had a huge slide. This all slid off. It was on a pre-existing plane and created this big mountain, plugged the whole city, or plugged the whole river and wiped out a town that was right here. Wow. And, th and this is an area that moves periodically over time, meaning it's got, it's got, because what happens is, is there's a slip plane here, like a geologic slip plane, where it's subjective to slippage based on this, based on the underlying formation being soft and getting saturated. What happens is this will over time erode out. It erodes the toe away because the river still needs to get through. Somehow it will work its way through. You know, it dams up and then it starts running over. Does that make sense? And then. It, and then it will wash away. And once this is washed away, it removes the source that was stopping this from slipping additional. Cause now all of a sudden you've taken the dirt away. That's stopping this from moving. So, so it's actually a place where you might expect it to have occurred. Even the same place may have occurred back then, same type of event. So that's one explanation. Yeah. And you can also possibly get their description by like volcanic debris, meaning just a bunch of volcanic material created this great mountain because you can get sometimes but i think this is probably a, maybe a little better explanation so and roughly, you're saying that an earthquake um can can cause this yeah if, especially if it's saturated meaning if the soil's all saturated 
an earthquake, it triggers the slide. Right. Yeah. So it's a pre it's an area that's predisposed to slippage and it will slip. It's a, it's a landslide that occurs periodically. It's just over a matter of time. Yes. And if it's saturated and an earthquake occurs, that would, that would definitely trigger a slippage. So then we look at, okay, we have these other cities, which nobody knows really where they are exactly. I, I did a textual analysis saying, well, it's like Gad, Gadiant, and Kishkum. They're all these wicked people, right? Jacob, we know that went north, somewhere in the north. All the apostates always love to go north. So, <laughs> so probably, you know, that's why the that's why the heart of the motto isn't very good. That's where all the apostates went. <laughs> <laughs> they went to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> right. But but we have these. And I talk about, you could maybe have two, maybe two volcanoes erupt at the same time. It's not unknown. So you would say, okay, now we can actually, again, use what we know. Sorensen didn't have these at any location, but I can at least say, based on some other volcanic eruptions where you have uh, material, because these were burnt fire from the sky, basically, cause we burn with fire, um, send down fire to destroy them. So you would expect, Basically, you can have that occur at about that distance away from the volcano. So we can say these cities were in that location somewhere. Again, it doesn't, it just helps us get more clarity to the model, right? Um, these are interesting ones because this is Gedeandai, Gedeamna, Jacob, and Gim Gimno for Jim Jim, I'm not sure. But it said sunk and made hills and place and valleys in the places thereof, buried in the depths. Um, you'd expect this to be within the proximity of the fault because it talks about them sinking, right? Um, but it's kind of it's interesting because this is actually a feature that wasn't really recognized by geologists until the Mount St. Helens eruption. And that is after pyroclastic flows, you get these deposits that are hills and valleys. So, hmm. you know, these are all just deposited after the Mount St. Helens erupted, right? This is the ash and this, and so it got buried, earthquake maybe got sunk from the volcanic earthquake or actually, you know, from the regional kind of either. And then it says there's hills and valleys where it used to be. And that's exactly what you get after. And it's not just from all like the debris from yeah from the pyroclastic flow has gone through and it deposits all this stuff and it kind of oh. because it's not uniform it deposits it in clumps and because there's wind and things so it's interesting because that that's something that you know I, it, it kind just, of forms like valleys and on hills kind yep. of yeah you have these little valleys and these hills club this pyroclastic material so so that actually describes very well what you would expect from uh on the flanks of a volcanic eruption. So, I mean, and also, you know, it's interesting because I mean, that's not a, nothing was really known about anybody writing this would not have known to write that. Right. I before about St. Helens, you know, if they were trying to fake, <laughs> uh, talk, you know, fake a description of volcanic eruption that would, they would not have included that. Right. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah. So, Then these, there's some other cities where it just talks about the waters coming up in the stead, stead thereof. I, I can't tell you exactly where those were for sure, but you would expect to look for them. Again, if you're trying to apply your model, uh, these parameters, they need to be somewhere where a river would be blocked or in the lake or something where the water would come up. So it has to come up in a short period of time. Again, so I'm not saying where it is, for sure, there are probably a lot of locations, but anybody doing a model has to, if they're going to put these cities somewhere, they have to consider that, right? And would these be considered the the sunken cities, but they're not necessarily saying, but you said the water level rises? Yeah, no, it says the water came up in the stead thereof. So uh -huh. that's a curious, that's an interesting thing. So, okay, where could that happen? Well, you could have maybe a landslide, blocks, and then, but they'd have to come up quick. So it'd have to be like a big river. Landslide came in and the water raised, water level raised, you know, flooded the city real quickly because the people died. They couldn't get out. Yeah. So it doesn't need, so you need to look at that, you know, so there are going to be limits to where you can place that. Now, Sorensen has it in Lake Atitlan. There's a, a city, Samabaj, that's underwater there. Um, 
Oh, that's only your slides. Yeah. Um, and so then you have Moroni, which sink into the depths of the sea. So you've got a sinking involved, um, not just a flood event, and it's got to be right on the, it's got to be in the ocean somewhere. <laughs> and so um, the city of Jerusalem, which we, so those are the kind of the water ones we're talking about. The city of Jerusalem, which we talked about where it has to, the waters come up. Uh, he's got it as Samabaj, which is a small, it's in Lake Atitlan. It's 60 meters down. The dating doesn't work exactly, but there, there have been multiples that Lake Atitlan does not have a uh, outlet. It's just the water goes out through cracks in the, in the, it's in a big volcanic caldera, a big old volcano. So if there's an earthquake, it can actually change the, the makeup. And so you, and so, um, and, but there is a volcano that erupted adjacent. We're not quite sure when. Um, there are other things in this lake that you could have that happen, like a landslide on the other side of the lake could cause a big wave to come across the lake. I actually talked to the guy that did an investigation on the lake. Um, he did, he drilled the core sediments and he said they were, uh, they got all their cores up. They had them in tubes. They were sleeping during the night. They heard all these popping sounds and they got up and all the tube, the tops of the caps of the tubes where the soil was, were popping off. And what he said is there's a stream amount of gas in the sediment. So you could actually have an earthquake that triggers kind of like a soda. They call it, it's happened in some African lakes where it, just turns the lake to seltzer right it's, it just releases all this gas and so it, the the level the water level goes up immediately because it's all gas you know gas and train so, right. so i would say that yeah so i'm not can't say for sure you know but it could jerusalem could be there i mean that Sorensen could have had that kind of have that in the right place so okay yeah this is the lake atitlan this is the samabaj the underwater city the city, it's actually very not very big. That's I kind of get into that in one an article I write. The great city, a great city like Jerusalem, is does not a size. It's a ceremonial center. If you look through the Book of Mormon closely, it's not related to size. And then all the all the great cities were all destroyed. Everything that's called a great city is destroyed. So I give kind of different scenarios, as I mentioned with Lake Atitlan. Um, you could have, you know volcano erupting into the lake you could have had a landslide into the lake you could also just have the bottom of the lake formation you know this configuration changed from the earthquake and you could also have a release of gas for moroni this is the one that fell into the sea that's where Sorensen has it um it's a little bit outside of the level eight intensity area but it's also within that um soil um liquefaction area so oh which raises it you know so you're essentially it it could have occurred because it's out in some it's, a, it's away from the major impact but as i mentioned sometimes you get at a distance away if the soil is that type you can have that and and do you know in your key would it be what were the colors you had like red yellow yeah, it would be like a six or something and then it could have raised it to an eight point four so it would get it up in the range where you would have the slumping and right and then the thing is there's actually been a, a really good example of it um like i said it's outside the main but but it would still reach the required shaking and shaking intensity and it's also located along the shoreline where the san martin is also on the shore so it's possible you could even have a tsunami or something um, off the volcano that could have accounted for it now, this is a city of Port Royal, Jamaica, that sunk into the ocean after an earthquake in the same kind had this was subject to liquefaction in 1692. Funny thing about this city is it was a pirate city. So when it was destroyed, everybody said it was because they were wicked. Kind of like right. <laughs> just like right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting, like the things it's describing about like city sinking, not something that that occurs you know yeah. with you know volcanic eruptions and earthquakes of course the critics would say oh joseph smith knew about this what happened and so that's why he wrote this the moroni city because he knew about port royal you know jamaica or something oh right because this happened in 1692 <laughs> yeah so, again it's 
I don't get into those arguments, but you know, Joe Smith had to be, he's either an idiot, a genius, and he read everything that was in the Palmyra, New York, and Dartmouth libraries. <laughs> yeah. In order to account for everything. <laughs> so and then he knew every Indian And then knew a lot about uh, uh, volcanoes and volcanic yeah. eruptions. Yeah, and he talked to every Indian tribe in the whole eastern United States. I don't know. So he got some instructed one story out of their history, you know, and threw it into the Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I don't go down that. I don't care about that. But it, sometimes it just it gets to be kind of ridiculous. But And this is just kind of showing where there was a... Um, it was basically talking about the sinking. You could have a sinking from a flooding event, a large ocean wave. This is a hurricane, which we're not talking about. But if you had a tsunami, this you could expect maybe more ice sunk. I mean, it, it would change elevation. One, one uh, just thought I will note is that the Book of Mormon seems very specific as we're going through this versus being very generic about the destruction happening in 35 and spe specific things that happened to specific cities and locations. Yeah, it's it's, it's it not being vague or generic about it right um you have sorensen has santa rosa which is actually under a reservoir right now so you can't really do any more excavation on it but as it could take fire now it's outside of the earthquake the main earthquake you know the, of damage but it's all it's still in the level four where you could get um it, it just says take fire so i kind of show in the book you can have an earthquake like in Japan. It wasn't that powerful, but it, you know, those, they, everything's flammable in those cities, wood buildings. If there's a wind, um, it can take fire. You know, you can have an upset of a, just a candle. I mean, not a candle, but whatever they used, anything that they use for fire. Um, you can also have the lightning to uh, cause it to take fire. So, so his location is there. Hemla is not, you know, it doesn't fall outside of, of the description that we would expect. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned there's, this is not in the book either. I've added this, there's some interesting correlations with the names of the destroyed cities. Like Josh is the Bible is an ash. I mean, that's, it's a biblical name. It means fire. Um, oh. Mokum, which is actually, I kind of did my own book on the Sumerian etymology. Some of these names are derived from Sumerian, it looks like. You know, means to crush, to place, or discharge. Um, move, I've got this picture. Discharge water. That kind of matches what how that was destroyed. This Jim Jimno was sunk with hills and valleys. Again, it's you can construct it from Sumerian to kill, storm, noise, pace like lava. Egyptian, it means to smash, tear up, to break. So it seems like that actually the etymology of that city name would, would match what happened to it. And, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. And Gadi Amna, same. You have Gada with flood, noise, corpse, shining, like, you know, shining power, paste, a paste like lava earth pile or something. So they could have been named, but again, it's, it's just saying, Hey, listen, some of these, you know, the last one's maybe not quite so tight, but your Josh is a pretty clear one, you know. Um, okay. Now we'll just get into a couple, like the Land of Nephi prison volcano event. This is the one where it talks about there was an earthquake. This is the sequence of events out of the text of the Book of Mormon. It says, first there's an earthquake, an overshadowing cloud, a second earthquake, a third earthquake, cloud of darkness had dissipated so this looks like a volcanic eruption with volcanic earthquakes in, with mm. some, in some proximity to the volcano does that make sense what i'm saying and if would there be that, multiple earthquakes usually that would follow a volcanic eruption yeah if it had multiple eruptions right and right. they don't have to be huge but it's like you know it erupts and then there's because it's the, it's the release of the pressure that's triggering the earthquake it's a kind of the shift of the magma coming out and so the and and then it, looking for, at the description, it's about a Mercalli four to five. And then meaning on that scale we had, meaning the prison didn't like total collapse or whatever, but it did shake, had some, it, they said it shook almost a, like they thought the walls were going to come down, you know, so 
again, it's some interpolation I'm making and saying that's kind of close to the damage. And then Sorensen has this event in the Camino Juyu area, Guatemala City. So then I said, okay, let's use that Zobin equation that we talked about earlier. And we have a volcano. Um, and would that match, you know, this where he has it? It wouldn't have to be a major eruption. So I'm not necessarily saying you're going to find like evidence of this eruption because it's not talking about, it doesn't, it, it doesn't appear to be a huge one. It's just destroying everything, right? But it's a smaller eruption. And if you calculate it using that equation, it comes to the outskirts of Guatemala City. So I would say, yeah, where he has that um, location actually is consistent with the geology. I Meaning there's a volcano, the Zobin equation, it falls within where you would expect that of, you know, that level of shaking to occur. Hmm. Then the Ammonia earthquake event, um, that one, the prison collapsed, right? Yes, that's right. And, and you had, um, and a lot of people got killed. They walked out all right, but everybody else got wiped out. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but that index, so that's like a level eight. Okay, so that, because again, you're talking about collapse of buildings. Uh, and this case would have just been a, an earthquake, not a not a volcano, just an earthquake. Yeah, there's no indication of any like cloud, right? They don't talk right. about it. Right. So okay, we're not we don't have to have a volcano here. Mm -hmm. Um, but it talks about this unusual great noise, if you remember. And then yeah. everybody came out. And so it's like, well, how does that? And some said, Oh, the prison collapsed, but I mean I, I don't know that that would have you know, but what but what you have happen? Um, there are certain earthquakes that create a sonic boom. Um, they have to be, they're called super shear earthquakes. Um, and it causes, it's because the fault is rupturing faster than the seismic waves can travel. And it creates a seismic mock cone that fires out of the end of the fault's rupture zone with this huge sonic boom. Um, and then it causes an orderly severe shaking more than the than the magnitude of the earthquake we would expect right um and these earthquakes have been observed almost exclusively in strike slip faults so if we're using that as a parameter we need to look for a strike slip fault not just a normal fault and it does have it only has to be a small regional one right we're just talking about one city here and these are um typically underlain by granite, some sort of granite when you have these super shear earthquakes. Here's where Sorensen has Ammonia. You have a strike slip fault right here. It's underlain. This is a formation. So this rock extends underneath here. These, 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 these formations cover this one. Sorry, is Ammonia, is that where the star is? Yeah, yeah. That's where Sorensen has put it. Okay. In this model, right. Uh, he, it's Mirador. It's not El Mirador, not the big one everybody talks about up in the Yucatan. It's Mirador, which is this is up in the highland of Guatemala Highlands. So, okay. So, it, it, so I'd say this is where his location matches very well. It's got a strike slip fault, earthquake zone, a super sure earthquake. Uh, it's underlain by metagranic. So, if that's what the loud noise was, matches very well. Okay. So, the city of Amnaiha in his geographical model. Uh, it's it's in the right location for yep, earthquake like that to happen. Yep, exactly. So, um, that's then cool. Well, well right, that, that so. adds that's another thing adding to sort of corroborating uh, and its sort of consistency and aligning with geology. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm saying so these geologic vents you need to look at, um, and and again, is there somewhere else you could have put Ammonia that still met you know the distance travel from. The other cities, I don't know, but where he's put it, it matches. Maybe somebody else can do. So I'm not saying, oh, this is for sure the spot. I'm just saying his model matches. So yeah, right, gotcha. And, and but there are other places where people. I mean, a lot of like some of the those American models had it in Yucatan. It's like that. Yeah, that doesn't work, right? Mm. So, and then they had a hard time because they were trying to put it somewhere else, and then. It, kind of cause problems because then it has to be you know 
because because you move one city, you try to move it somewhere. If that affects everything else. Exactly. So, you, you know, it's not a simple thing to just, oh, I'll just move this city over here. Right. Uh, so. Um, this is something that also wasn't in the book. So it's Lehi's prayer, a pillar of fire dwelt upon a rock, right? He went to the land of his inheritance for, um, when he left Jerusalem the first time to get his prophetic calling, right? He had, there was a pillar of fire that dwelt upon a rock. So I'm looking. That's at in the very first chapter, isn't it? Is that the talk yep. about? Right. right. So I'm thinking, okay, another, I mean, again, you could explain it. All the theophanies, uh, most of the theophanies of the Book of Mormon and even the Bible, they talk about, you know, fire, smoke, something. Um, I kind of say, I do think there's kind of volcanic, you know, things related to those. Even in the Jaredites, when it's talked about it's followed by a cloud, I can kind of show where they went. There was a volcano. They went out. The wilderness beyond the sea was in the Canary Islands. That was a great place for it. And there was the volcano erupting at that time because they followed the cloud, went before them, you know, when they were traveling. So I kind of say, you know, there seems to be some correlation here. And they go up on the top of a mountain, right, where there's cloud, where there's smoke or something. And anyway, so I'm saying, okay, is there a place, is, is there a place in, does this make sense geologically? And yes, because Manasseh, that's, you know, he's from the tribe of Manasseh, right? So he left Jerusalem somewhere up in here was his lands. There is a volcanic field that, uh, actually um comes into here where it is has been active not not big volcanoes just smaller little cinder cones and things so that matched i would say hit you know that matches it's again it's old world matching but but lehi going there and seeing that is also consistent with i mean the book of mormon is consistent with the geology it's not really a model, right? It's because we know where Jerusalem is and everything. But... Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay, so again, kind of what's been accomplished by the effort is we established all the geological criteria. Everything that Book of Mormon explains is geologically possible or probable. Um, provides you parameters to evaluate any of the models. You know, like the Heartland model, for example. We don't get into the discussion, but that's one that they're going to have to look at. And then we're going we're gonna to talk about that later in the next part is sort of uh, analyzing the heartland model and uh, a little bit, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, with geology and, and does it support it or not? Right. And then um, there are a variety of these event tumultuous noises, great mountain, they'll have plausible explanation in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Um, we've also defined some areas Um Meaning I can tell, you know, it's got to be within some distance of the volcano or it's got to be somewhere where the water can arise quickly. So it's not telling us exactly where those cities are, but you've got to have, if you're going to put these cities in your model, they got to be in, in somewhere in that zone. Right. Um, and then again, we, I've kind of gone through, it's got to be a regional earthquake. You got to have a volcano. If, if you're if you're not going to have a volcano, then you got to explain these things some other way, right? Which there's problems with that in any of the ones I've seen. And then I've established, you know, that the San Martin is a very probably the most likely, yeah, one. best candidate. Yep. Uh, and do you know roughly what what year? Because um, I know it's probably difficult to the rate. Uh, it's a it's a rate. They like when they do radiometric dating. I mean, to date, be precise. Weapons, yeah, because you've got to take, okay, the volcanic material went on top of some um, organic material because radiometric dating has to be organic material, right? You can do dating of rocks themselves, but that way old, like said millions of years, but anything in, the, in this recent time frame. So again, we had, there is the eruption, we had a stele that was covered that was dated 31 BC. So we know the, that eruption was after that. It was, I think the eruption was something like to 100 AD or something. I'd have to look up exactly what they, the range that they thought that that eruption occurred. But it, so, so, and that's why I say all these volcanoes identified, they were within the range, you know, meaning I'm looking at 27, 28 AD. They could say, well, this eruption occurred from 
50 BC to 100 AD. I have to include those, right? We just don't know. Right. When. So it's within the range, but it's it's a plausible candidate. Yes. Yeah, uh, I don't have it. It's it's not like see in Vesuvius and that they knew because they had you know you had record keeping and you know Pliny who died in it. You know he got overcome by the gas out on his boat trying mm -hmm. to rescue people. And he got he died from the vapors, and that's one thing it talks about people succumbing to the vapors in the Book of Mormon. That's what that's talking about, I think um right yeah. and i think so you're kind of showing that like this um you know the geological activity that you know about mesoamerica volcanic eruptions the earthquake uh san martin volcano that it it correlates and converges pretty well with um the destruction and the phenomena described in third nephi and that it pre presents a very plausible case and you've also shown uh how John Sorensen's Mesoamerican geography model is very consistent with what you know about geology and what would have happened uh, to yeah, certain so, you know, cities and locations. And, and that's why it kind of Brant says these convergences. This isn't just like, oh, they got writing. This is like specific on the ground mm -hmm. locations, right? So it's not, it's not, there's kind of these generic cultural convergences people talk about, you know, they had to have kings and things like that. And those are important things this is uh, this is like next level in my opinion meaning you're getting down yeah to like me this almost things. seems like another layer uh yeah. reinforcing and support supporting the mesoamerican geography model yeah and see that here's here's the way i've i have a different approach to the parallels and things you know people say well these parallels don't parallel ology everything well uh, parallel mania it, yeah, yeah parallel mania sorry ology it's, I'm not, it's not evidence Right, but that's that's not that's incorrect in the sense that you have to look it, it, you have to look for parallels to even investigate an area, right? Meaning, right. if there's no parallels, well, okay, it's not there. So it, it's I call it first level evidence, meaning it's kind of your first cut to say, okay, um, these don't prove it's here, but these are minimum criteria it has to meet. So it narrows, it, it's still evidence of narrowing the field of potential locations. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so people say, oh, it doesn't prove it. It's like, well, it's not trying to prove it exactly. It's just trying to exclude other areas. So that's that's evidence, right? And then, then and it's also, there are different levels of evidence or parallels, meaning it's like, okay, well, there are forts here. Well, okay, that's not. That a lot of civilizations have forts, right? Yeah, it's very generic. Yeah, it's generic, but there are some complex parallels. Like, for example, you have like the snails that the that they extracted purple dye in Phoenicia from the glands of the snail to make their purple dye, which they were known for. You have that happen in Mesoamerica too with these sea snails. It's like that's a that's just not you know that that's a complex parallel is what i'm saying i mean that that's not something you would expect generically mm, like with yeah. the plates you have depletion gilding that's a process that's found in the old world and the new world it's not just a simple thing you know you have to know to apply this acid and rub it and and get the surface those are kind of those are parallels but they're more evidentiary parallels i mean it's a different a higher level right you're yeah approach, you're, you're approaching different level of evidence so that so the geological geological parameters, this is not a generic, right? You're you're getting parallels much more specific, especially when you're getting a model and identifying cities that meet it almost exactly, like a super sheer earthquake or something. I mean, you're just not going to get that many places where that occurs. So the fact that Sorensen came up, Sorensen didn't know any of this. He just came up with it all within the, and so you've applied another level it's not really a parallel. It's it's a higher evidentiary level. Is it absolute proof? You know, like Dan Vogel says, is is it a sign that says Nephi? You know, on this on this land of Nephi or something? You know, they're looking for these things. But I'm saying, I think actually now we're finding some like with this correlation I mentioned off camera or with Aaron, you know, and and the Born of Fire, the same you know Maya general that was taking over took over to call at the same time. Mm -hmm. So. so so part of it is we don't have, so, so I guess what I'm saying is they're all just saying it's, you know, they quote Michael Coe saying, well, it's like, well, a lot of, a lot of more information is available than Michael Coe. Yeah. Was saying there were. And Michael Coe, he wasn't, 
he doesn't, he was not, not versed in the book of Mormon just generally. And he was saying, and he even said there are no, there weren't cities like that. Well, right when he was saying that on the Mormon stories podcast, I was like, well, they actually just did the LIDAR showing 20 million people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, yeah. And so he was making statements and he actually changed his position too. He, he basically said, Hey, there were no, there's no, any visiting, you know, as America was totally isolated from any outside contact. Well, then he went up and worked in Cambodia and he came back and he said, Oh, wow. He goes there. He goes, I, he goes, I do think there maybe was some contact, not from, you know, not from the Hebrews, but from China, you know, because there's like things again, complex things. Like they call the man in the moon. It's the rabbit in the moon. That's what they use in Mesoamerica. That's also what they use in Southeast Asia. Right. So, so he was saying, hey, there are some of these things that are a little too complex. Uh, they're, 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 they're getting beyond where you could expect independent invention. Mm. Uh, and again, it's not like the whole... That, that's another problem is people, unfortunately, the LDS people read the Book of Mormon and say, oh, there's this huge civilization. It's all Nevi. <laughs> Meaning they're and not going to do us any favors when it archaeologists yeah, looked and, at and it. Like, well, there were people there. They were in for, they were a small group. You're only you should you would only expect I mean it's a small group coming in so even culturally you would expect only traces right you're not yeah like they, they should they'll most likely adopt the surrounding culture and language that sort of what and Frank Gardner talked about in in his book and that that does make sense if you think about it logically if if you were a small group of people and you migrated to another country it's unlikely right. that you'll transform the 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 civilization the the culture but you'll more likely adopt uh that and the iconography and things and and i i just know because you know i i was married to someone from another country and moved to america um she maintained a lot of her italian culture but my kids the old the two oldest speak okay my son he went on a mission to italy and is an italian citizen but he didn't speak any italian <laughs> so so what i'm saying is that that doesn't take that long okay yes we have a more complex society and things like that but but and if, if you look at the book of Mormon, even in in enos it says he had to learn the languages of his fathers yeah so one generation removed right uh, so, uh no king, so king it, it wasn't the lingua, it wasn't, yeah it wasn't and that's even later right but even yeah. that early it was not the lingua franca right that was not there was other language he had to actually learn these it wasn't like oh he just knew them that tells yeah. you right right at the beginning there was uh, a lot of influence so and i can't remember if it was king benjamin or the sons of Mosiah, but i remember there was a scripture that um said that his sons were sort of trained in in the language of their fathers in their writing and sort of like the implication is that like well if they were sort of trained in it to like preserve the language of their fathers that yeah. probably was not the language they were speaking then if they yeah, and exactly. And I, I think Reformed Egyptian was really a priestly language, to be honest with you. It wasn't a lingua franca. It was kind of on the plates, and yes, they used it, but it wasn't what was out there. Yeah. They weren't using it in business or anything like that, you know. So so I, I, we think, know there, I think we know there are multiple languages, right? Because it talked about the languages. Zenith was knew the languages of the Nephites, you know. And so so it was a multilingual society and so I, I guess there are clues if we look for them to not, so we should not have an expectation of, you know, excavating all these menorahs or something. You know? I mean, I mean, they are acculturated and like they say, layman, laymanites were just people that didn't believe the way they believed. So, so, and you do see, and, and you know, other people have raised this and I'm the same as you actually see, you can look for, these types of things in Mesoamerica, and you can maybe find traces of certain things, but you're you're more likely to find Mesoamerican stuff in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and that that was Brian Gardner. That's what his book was about, and it was a big change for me, a change in assumptions as well. What we expect to find, I think, a lot of you know Latter-day Saints or ex members would see it as you know we should see Hebrew writing everywhere. You know we should see um that you know the native americans were all speaking hebrew and we should see the names of the cities and you know we, we should see their dna and yeah. he was kind of his book was more coming along the lines of 
rather than looking at Mesoamerican, that everything we understand about Mesoamerica comes from the Book of Mormon. It's more seeing Mesoamerica in the Book of Mormon. Does it align with the culture or geography or kind of like what you've outlined here? Like, does exactly. what happened in the Book of Mormon, does it align with what we understand about geology in Mesoamerica? And it's it's a different uh, endeavor. It, it's more convergences versus like absolute proof. But I think right. it's I think it can be just as strong a case when you take a lot of these things in totality. Like if it's if it fits and it's kind of consistent. Because if you find like say just a random city with like Z H M L on it, but then nothing else sort of correlated, then that could easily be a a, a coincidence. Well, some of the things it's like, oh, why don't you find the name of a city? It's like, well, there are, we don't have hardly any names of any Maya cities known. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, even in Mayan, forget about if they're tra if they're you know using their own language because in Mesoamerica they it's what's called calcs, so they typically do that. They don't like transliterate. Um, they they actually just put the same meaning in their own language, uh, so they're not bar they don't necessarily borrow. You know, it's like we call. Paris is Paris or something close, or you know, I don't know what the original Celtic is in Ireland or Dublin or something. Meaning, so you have these names, but that's in Mesoamerica, they often would just use calc, meaning they would take because of the name had a meaning, so it would be like um, you know, like this this, you know, born of fire, this general, this this high um um warrior person born of fire well you wouldn't expect a transliteration of you know she cock in 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 maya but what has happened is they've taken the meaning and put it in their own language where they can understand the meaning of the name does mm. that make sense That's so, interesting. So, yeah so like all these people are saying well, where's all this we should be seeing all these um these city these lamanites should have like maya sounding names right because i mean the way it's kind of like the Maya culture tends to look more Lamanite, you know, type thing. But it's like, no, you're not understanding. The Book of Mormon isn't doing that. It's not taking the names. It's putting them all into Hebrew, Egyptian, or some form of Sumerian, constructed Sumerian, every single name. And there's a couple of Greek names, which maybe, you know, came with the Mulek people. Mulek, because they came out of probably Phoenicia or something. Um, we don't even know what, who was on the crew of the ship or whatever. We don't know anything about it much. Mm. Well, so I'm going to talk about, I think, in a future episode, because, you know, I, I've said that we want to talk about, you know, your work on the gold plates, characters document. Maybe we could touch on uh, yeah. some of the, the names in the Book of Mormon as well. Is there anything you want to say in closing about uh, sort of Mesoamerica and geology before we talk about Heartland? And this could be a good place to start for part one, and then we can yeah. move on to this next part of your presentation. Yeah, again, kind of like I say, the, the scope of this was to actually lay out the geology on the ground. Uh, I think this has done that. This work has done that. It's shown that the Sorensen model is consistent. Could other models be consistent? Perhaps, but they have to show that. And it's also shown that everything in the Book of Mormon, um, the descriptions all match geologic phenomenon. Mm. So, and even details that you would not have expected, like hills and valleys and the place thereof, that kind of thing. So, yeah. And what would you say to someone? Um, uh, I think this has been a, a really good presentation. It's gone into a lot of depth as well. So I think this has been great. But someone might say, well, what would other geologists think of what you presented? Um, would they would they agree with it? Is this just uh, pseudo scholarship you employing in apologetics, um, trying to get this to correlate with the Book of Mormon? Uh, what would you respond to somebody who's skeptical of what you presented? Well, I guess what I would say is this, is yes, I mean, it's the, it's the same question you always have for anything, you, any any endeavor of study of the Book of Mormon. It's like, you can either assume it's a bunch of BS written by Joseph Smith. If it isn't, then what is it? It's some miraculous thing, right? And so from a scientific standpoint, they're always looking at that. That's why people say, why aren't more, why aren't more... <laughs> You know, archaeologists using the Book of Mormon to find things in Mesoamerica is like, well, it's because it came from an angel you know, on play. I mean, the story of its genesis is supernatural. So science by its nature is not supernatural. They're looking for non-supernatural explanations, right? Typically. 
So if a geologist looked at this, he would, I would, he would say, yes, everything that you've done is geologically correct. Would he go as far to say that the Book of Mormon took place in Mesoamerica? No, because they wouldn't. If it was an LDS geologist, like there have been, like uh, I did get a book review from a um, fellow out of the University of, of BYU, Hawaii. You know, he says, oh, yeah, it's actually really good. So, yes, faithful geologists would say, yeah, it's consistent. I think most geologists would say, well, we don't believe the Book of Mormon, but at least the way you've applied it. At least that's, I've got a few comments back saying, that that yeah that was ex actually kind of interesting the way you've done it and yeah they, they probably find it interesting parallels and and they would say that the geology and the, the scholarship uh they they would agree with it but they just wouldn't want to yeah. side with the implication yeah. right because according what, to Book Mormon yeah. so they would go as far to say yeah the the you know the Veracruz fault system just like you say the volcanoes like you say it erupted like you say does the Sorensen Book of Mormon model fit well we don't believe in that yeah <laughs> yeah there's no way that's like out of the book of Mormon, you know so yeah I, that's what i would expect probably a comment would be from somebody that was did not care you know was not was a and honestly most geologists there's very few that are even faithful christian anything most of them are agnostic or atheist you know kind of just that's just a general i don't want to say for sure but going to conferences and things i think of most of them because it goes to age of the earth other things they have problems with the biblical accounts you know so they just tend to like discount all those things as, right you know, I mean, you know, so the book of mormon is the least of their worries is what i'm saying they're, they're yeah. worried about, the, about the flood and, they're, they're probably not yeah, even just, yeah even concerned by it. and i i made this point of video i did on archaeological evidence and i would say like i made the point that most non LDS archaeologists, geologists, scientists, they they won't be they're just gonna be doing geology or archaeology. They're not out there looking to try to prove or, or disprove yeah. the Book of Mormon. That they're not gonna yeah. be looking to see how it aligns or or fits with the Book of Mormon. I know some of you might say, well, Michael Coe maybe was, but as you said, maybe wasn't as familiar with the Book of Mormon as most LDS scholars and, and things have advanced from them yeah. but that's not on their radar exactly well, i think like, any like religious david, text like david stewart excellent the best you know my uh epigrapher everything i don't know if you know he is super great but he wrote a book and he, <laughs> and he and he did mention something about the book of mormon but he said yeah they believe the nephrites no, he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't really even know the exact the proper name of the nephrites you know when he was coming it just tells you he's only generally familiar with kind of what the Book of Mormon might he's never really gone into any depth in it and looked because it's like, why would I? Yeah, and I imagine and they I, want I, to I don't, stay I don't, away in, from I don't that. believe in an, I don't believe in angels, I don't believe in gold, I don't believe in any of this stuff. Why would I ever use that as a source? No, yeah. it make any sense. I mean, I, I wouldn't if I was in that situation. Yeah. So, so kind of like what you did, what you know, you're doing, uh, like Frank Garner, John Swanson is is using. Uh, the scholarship and their scholarly credentials to compare what scholarship is saying uh, and aligning that, does it align with what's in the Book of Mormon? Right. And so I, th I think what I'm saying is, is you, you, you're you not, it's this expectation of people that, oh, all these other people are going to read the Book of Mormon and go show. It's like, just like you said, no, it, it's different than it. It's different than the Bible. Right, the Bible. We have like these. Okay, we have a historic. We have this history. We have locations. We know. We know kind of where it came from. Meaning, you don't even have to have a supernatural. It's, oh, we had these people that believed in these gods, and they wrote their books. And you know, in fact, even like the, you know, Deuter Isaiah. Like part of the parameter is they assume their prophecy is impossible. So, you know, with Cyrus, so they they're coming from a total different standpoint right but if you mm -hmm. are somebody that can uh, that has a belief in potential supernatural and potential you know intervention of god then um you are actually you're approaching it differently because you're saying these might be events that actually occur mm -hmm. uh, i mean there's a book on you know on the exodus right it's it's an individual he's christian but he's a scientist showing yeah, all these can be explained naturalistically, the plagues and then where they went and 
and he actually has like the Sinai as a volcano, which I kind of subscribe to. Hmm. Uh, it located in Arabia, and actually that's the path that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to write a book on that too. I think a small book showing it actually matches the Exodus path. It's part of what the Lehi was doing. Some of the names are the same. Like Shazer means trees. And one of the stops in, of the Exodus means trees, you know. And he has it in exactly the same place as Book of Mormon scholars have it. So so I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's you cannot expect... Um, if people are thinking that they're going to be all these non LDS people endorsing the book of Mormon. Right. That's yeah. Not, that's not going to happen. And, and because they don't believe it's, you know, it's just, it came from a supernatural place, right? It's not, they don't believe God does anything. And, and I, I've actually got criticism from some LDS. I wrote this book and they said, well, you're, you're kind of explain, why are you doing this? I mean, that was all, you know, the, the catastrophe was, um, it's all supernatural like it was all god yeah and i actually show i mean that book i said listen it says it was caused by god so um and in and, and my upcoming book i kind of show actually that the you know the night of brightness was caused by a coronal mass emission it matches everything it shifts the northern lights down into mesoamerica uh, which would be the signs and wonders and people say well you're explaining that. i said no the the amazing thing is is that they knew it was going to happen. God had told them. I mean, who could predict that? Yeah. Meaning, meaning that it's not that God is, God's not just down here zapping things. Oh, I got to fix that. It's like, yeah, it's because there would be no, like this, um, you know, this aligning with a volcanic eruption and earthquakes. This is something that we can sort of test and see. Whereas if, if it was just all supernatural and God right. just caused it, there's no way we could look and determine does this have any plausibility with, yeah, see, with to, theology to me, history to me i look at god time is all before him right i mean I, i'm saying it's a bigger miracle to be that he would know when everything it, even this level of detail of a, of a volcanic eruption and an earthquake know when that's going to occur and, and maybe you know what i'm saying and, and i i don't know it's just that that to me is even more powerful of of knowledge, I mean, of God of knowledge. I don't know how to explain this really in a, really a conceptual way, but but I, I look at the fact that he knew, that, that he knows these things are naturally going to be potentially occurring. I'm not saying he couldn't cause some of these things to happen, but, you know, by direct, you know, causing something. But, but to me, it's like it, to have it all be known in advance of these, events that are we can't have any idea of predicting <laughs> I, I, yeah. I don't know to me that's miraculous right and, and to me the, like what you presented frank gardner's book it just makes it a bit more plausible to me you know just yeah. mormon historicity is not just all supernatural fantasy but you know there's some yeah, things it actually, which, it actually happened right. yeah like it yeah this m might have actually happened not one final question before we end for part one, because somebody might say like, okay, maybe this is um, credible geological scholarship that you're sharing and this is interesting, but they might say, well, there's no definitive proof for the Book of Mormon and these are just parallels and what if this what if this is all just a coincidence? Um, and, and you've got other problems, you know, they might say DNA, anachronisms. Uh, I read, my, read my other six books, so... <laughs> <laughs> do, do you address those things or do, or do you talk well, about DNA, D DNA uh, again it's I mean Ugo Perego uh, all those people have addressed it very well yeah and uh, I didn't interview with him so we don't have to talk about that but but yeah, why, but why for you uh why not say that this is just uh coincidence and I mean there, well, no proof well again it's partly is who is studying this me Brant Gardner BYU's not I mean there's really not there's not is part of the problem is you have so few people really engaged. There may actually be different levels of evidence. We just haven't, you know, observed it. And I'm just saying the evidence seems to be, I'm finding it all consistent, right? It's becoming more and more consistent, more and more predictable. Yeah. Um, the reality is there's only so much information in the book of Mormon. It wasn't written as a historical, you know, history. It wasn't written as a, you know, a description of all the natural disasters they had or anything like that. It had a right, specific, yes. 
scope, right? So so you can only expect in the spiritual so record. Right. So you can only expect so much underlying things to look for, right? And and yeah. in fact, like I said, that was the interesting thing. It's like some of the critics say, Oh, it's just shrinking in size. It used to be the hemispheric model, which I think they did follow, you know, that's what they believed way back then. It's like I didn't approach it. I just when I read it, I mean, I remember on my mission, somebody said, "Oh, this is a history of all the American Indians in North America." I said, "That's not the case," and I didn't go to seminary <laughs> or nothing. You know, I just read it. I just, it's a small area. I can I can just tell just by reading it, right? It's funny that you picked up on that because I I never did. You know, like looking at the distances traveled and that it couldn't, it, it had to be a more limited geographical area. I would have just grown up and assumed you know, hemispheric geography, you know, land northward, North America, land southward, South America, okay. and uh, I land, Panama. And I I, ne- I wouldn't have thought anything of it. So I struggled whenever I then first learned, say, about DNA or other things, assuming they're the only people and it was the hemispheric geography. And, and all those assumptions when the book, Book Mormon, never explicitly claims hemispheric geography or claims yeah. that there are people here that was just uh i i would say both the early saints as well probably joe smith and other leaders that was how they probably read and understood it and yeah i think it's pretty clear that they kind of did it and see it's probably maybe your experience because i you know before i went on my mission i i worked as a geologist so you know i'd only been a couple years ago i did two years of college before my mission but i did exploration you know i had a horse going through the sawtooth wild wilderness area in idaho took me three weeks to get through that place you know i'm kind of mm-hmm. like well, there's no way i'm just saying i had experience traveling through wild country you know mountains and things so when they're talking about yeah they you know went from camora i went all the way up to camora from from central america to fight a battle i'm like why would the lamanites bother you know? <laughs> they already they already yeah. held all the rest of america why would they care to go conquer somewhere up in, in <laughs> new york you know? yeah that's actually a good point um, no i'm just because you know, i just reasoned through it's just, it doesn't make any sense you know i mean I, again because people are like reading it super i was just reading it practically right I'm right saying, right these people really existed well they weren't doing that you know I mean, why would they you know run all the way up there to defend some little glacial drumlin <laughs> that wasn't like too special about new, yeah hill corn exactly That's not, <laughs> it's not like it was a place where there was you know gold or i mean it had no resources it was just like i don't know i just when i approached the book and maybe it's just because of my background i'm just more practical I'm more scientific and mm, yeah I, I just never really I don't, I just approached it differently. And so when I was reading, and I was also understanding the other thing is I understood it's an ancient text, right? So it's a translation of an ancient text. Now there's been some modification or managed, you know, it's put in a format or obviously it can be used in the later days and be translated to populations to teach that maybe aren't super highly educated, you know, meaning, meaning, because I did translate, you know, I've, I, I've worked as a translator too. It's like, yeah, I translate differently depending on who the target audience is, right? If I'm if I'm translating a computer manual, it's different than it for the IT guys than it is for the operator, right? That's got to actually, um, you know, use a system or something. So I, mm-hmm. I kind of intuitively understood that I'm not expecting this, you know, this word for. I mean, people have all these terms for the translation, you know, yeah, like literal word. Word for yeah, word. I don't even. I never approach it that. I don't. It's like, yeah, I think it was kind of dictated to him or whatever. But I don't expect that everything in the plates made it through, right? Meaning, right? They they had cultural things. We wouldn't know what the heck it's talking about. We still wouldn't know, even with all the study we've done in Mesoamerica. You know, maybe some ceremony. We was like, well, you know, I don't. I, what is that? You know, so so it had to be fashioned in a way that. Um, so, and after all, people talk about translation. I mean, it was really interpreted. That's really that they're called the interpreters, not the translators. So you would expect, mm-hmm. you know, maybe there's I mean, even though Joe Smith said translation, he didn't really know what was on the plates exactly, right? I mean, if he just got whatever, either he read it on the stone or some people thought you know, he saw it in his mind. But but whoever it was, not him doing it. It was a, if he was getting divine, it was somebody else was giving it to him either through some direct in his mind or reading it. But so does that make sense? I'm saying, so there wasn't, he did, he did translate a few characters, you know, he looked at it through the 
the interpreters and said, okay, that character means this. So mm -hmm. There was a little bit of that, but no, I think, so even like the geology, you know, I, I look at it because I looked at, okay, rending of the rocks, all these things, it's like, they probably had a different term, you know, meaning, but they, but they had to put it in kind of King James Bible kind of language and, yeah. and, and their, their target translation, you know, it's, it's like you have, when you translate, you have a source text, what you're translating, you have a target. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're taking it from one and, you know, you've talked about this before, you can either like do literal, right. But that almost makes no sense in any language you translate, you know, I mean, well, I speak Chinese, it. I mean, Chinese is like, I go town, you know, they don't even use verb, they don't even use conjugation, right. <laughs> so, so, so you can't, you can't do that kind of, there's no very few languages you can, you know, they gotta be closely related. And so you're, you're always restructuring and doing those things. So then you have yeah. that plus, then you have who's the target audience. What are you trying to say? What are you trying to convey? What's the purpose of the translate of, of this document that you're translating? And so, yeah. so with the book of Mark, I don't know all those things. I don't know what God I'll totally had in mind, but I'm, I'm flexible with the tech does meaning, I, I don't have this expectation that I know all the intent of the translation. And so I can just take it for what it is. And, um, and even like looking at it scientifically, it's not a scientific text. Right. So I have to take that in mind. Like I mentioned, it's like, well, partly this seems to be structured to describe the prophecy, the fulfillment of the prophecy. That Mormon's doing a lot of that, right? He's saying, here's mm -hmm. the prophecy, here's how it's fulfilled. I, you know, and so when I'm reading it, the description, I'm like, okay, I think it was probably influenced a bit by the prophecy itself. Not that the thing didn't occur, but he's obviously describing it in a way to show the fulfillment of Samuel the Lamanite's prophecy mm. and the earlier prophecy of Zenus, you know, that Nephi talks about. Uh, so so we, we talked about it before. Uh, so I want to just finish on this because you know, you're saying that, um, you know, there's, there's some people, you know, maybe from, you know, BYU studies or that aren't really, are almost acknowledging maybe the Book of Mormon may not be historical or they're not really uh, putting out uh, articles or, or research to try to support it. You know, it's mainly been like, you know, John Sorensen, um, you know, the farms crew, Brant Gardner, yourself that are sort of trying to put out research and scholarship to support you know actually you know there's a case to be made for book of mormon history and even i like before i started my channel i said do you think off air that i was sort of um unsure about book of mormon historicity in in the americas and that seemed like a lot of scholars were sort of going that way like do you have any thoughts on that because it you know it seems like you know people like maybe patrick mason or uh, you know, I don't want to name too many names specifically, but yeah. it seems like some of those people might be leaning away from like Book of Mormon historicity. Yeah. And I think part of it is, you know, number one, I, I'm not, the church has taken a position one way or the other that they don't really want geography discussed in any, in any church setting. They have kind of a statement of that way. And so, yeah, they don't want to promote a, a certain geography. This is where it happened. Yeah. And then, and then what's happened is, and so you had farms, right. Who was doing a lot of this kind of thing. And you could argue they were too aggressive and calling people names. You know, they're kind of yeah. apologists, right. I get it. I'm not an apology, but I get how they get all angry. They can get a bit polemic. Can't it? Right. But you know, okay. I was in politics for 12 years, so it's pretty tame what they've done <laughs> compared to what I experienced. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so so basically, unfortunately, and so like BYU, you don't have any very little scholarship going on um, in this area. Like the geology, I went up there and I says, hey guys, why don't we go do a project in Lake Atitlan? Maybe we can figure out better. It doesn't even have to be LDS related, but they're just like, oh, we're doing, all our money comes for global warming stuff. So, so there's not a lot of scholarship being driven inside the church and by church institutions related to this. So you kind of have a paucity so you have, you know, me, Brant Gardner, there's a, you know, one fellow up at BYU, Kerry Hall does some things, but it's, it's pretty limited. John Sorensen passed away. So, and, and, and Book of Mormon Central has some people, but they kind of don't do research for the most part. They do a little bit. They're mostly just putting out, relying on other people's stuff. And so, you yes, kinda... it seems like that. I, th I think it's, it's great what they do. They do it in a yeah, good exactly. sort of easy to consume sort of way, little articles, little videos. 
um, right. and so, trying to make it accessible the scholarship and research that's being done and that's and that's kind of what i'm saying it's like and i do books and but people don't i mean richard bushman actually you know just included in a couple of pages on my on my book of mormon plate metallurgical scientific analysis of everything yeah so it's, it's people are picking and it's like that is supportive that the plates actually existed in the exact way that meaning so so it's not it's not where it took place but i'm saying no these the description of these plates is exactly what you would expect the black engravings are exactly what you would recreate in a depletion gilding to protect the underlying base and, and that adds credibility because if first your bushman's uh you know quoting uh you know using some of your work and everyone knows him you know yeah an historian on you know joseph smith right yeah and, and i'm and so and, and of course i don't write I, I don't, I don't try to impress anybody. I don't really care if, you know, I mean, academics can read what they want to read, but my stuff is all, I'm not speculating for the most part. It's just science application of science. So anybody can read it. It doesn't, it's, it's not like I'm going out, um, you know, proposing what are you, you know, I'm not, I'm not speculating on stuff. You don't, you don't have to rely on, yes, it's good. I'm a geologist, but you could read it and it's like I said, any geologist would look at this and say, well, yeah, it's all correct. What he's saying, you know, the subduction zones and everything. So, yeah. So, yeah. So my approach is a little different and I, I'm not, I don't promote, I don't go out and I'm not in academia. So I don't have to like publish 20 articles, you know, to move up to full professorship or something. <laughs> I could care less, you know, about, about that whole field. And in fact, a lot of academia, I think is really, unfortunately is ego driven too. So you have, and I just don't care about any of that. And I, I just try to publish my stuff and if people like it, they like it. But I do think if you actually look at the research that's out there, that we've, they were approaching a lot more evidence of historicity than we've had before. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and, and most, even the anachronisms, like, you know, I didn't talk about the metals, but sometimes we're looking for the wrong things, you know, like, like silver and gold, they use that and horses and chariots, you know, I mean, that term, but like in, in Mesoamerica, they use kennings is what they're called. Where, like, let's uh, say the eagle and jaguar, that's talking about a warrior. You have to understand the culture to understand what it's talking about. It's not talking about an eagle or a jaguar. They're called kennings. It's a, it's a literary technique that Aztec poetry has it in, you know, quite a bit. And so sometimes they're getting hung up on something in the Book of Mormon. It's just like, well, we're not understanding maybe where it's coming from. And so you're looking for something that really isn't even expected to be there. So, so what I'm saying is we understand the text better as, you know, I, I sponsored Brian Stubbs work, right? I paid for his book. At, I'd, I'd his love book. to bring him on as well. Cause um, you know, he's a great linguistic scholar and yeah. I also read a little bit about the, you know, Uzu Aztecan language. And I thought that could be interesting to. Maybe... Yeah, if, you go on my, if you go on my website, that whole book is there for free download. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I think as I... well, like, I, part of my channel as well as I've been, you know, trying to dive a little bit deeper, looking at what faithful scholars are saying as I'm, you know, approaching some of these topics or controversial issues is to try to bring some of this scholarship more to light. Not that my channel is like a huge resource, but like um, yeah, I'm trying to bring on people that. like yourself or Brent Gardner and to promote some of this. And so people can have access to some of the, you know, evidence or convergences that faithful scholars are presenting, which, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have been aware of, you know, before starting the channel, because you kind of have to dive a little bit more deep, you know. And I think that's kind of what I was saying. The church doesn't really promote a lot of this stuff. They kind of, and, and like, take me what you, they, and the Heartlanders, Jonathan Neville complains about this too, but it's that we had all these, you know, models that have been developed, whether you go with Heartland or whatever, but at least in Mesoamerica, they've been worked on, spent a lot of time looking at, you know, explanations for silk and all these things you know so most anachronisms are mostly gone honestly if you look closely at the research i mean a lot of times they're giving anachronisms like i already wrote the wikipedia page which everybody already accepted non-lds a lot of these anachronisms are gone just from what we know and so um but what happens is you don't have anyone it's not in any church curriculum byu kind of they developed, they actually went backwards. They proposed a map that's just like a theoretical map, you know, 
looks like you know Tolkien's Middle Earth kind of thing. I've seen that one. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and I'm like, why are you using that? We we had we already had that map in 1955. I mean, that was the first step in trying to figure out, okay, where is everything located? Again, it's a theoretical model. I'm like, why are you throwing away all this years of research and John Sorens' work and everything to go to that? Yeah. And it's because probably a way to like have harmony and people not no contention or disputing over it. But my yeah. sort of view is like, I'm I'm happy and I think we should accept people in the church who hold different geographical models. I think ultimately what matters is if, if they believe in the Book of Mormon, you know, being of divine origin, like we don't need to, you know, be against each other for different models. But I, I also think there's a, a place to discuss the different models and to look at the evidence and arguments for and against. And I think that's that's necessary yeah. as well. I think there should be a place for that. Yeah, and I guess all I'm saying is, is I looked at it like this is, you know, I, I it's just like people are like leaving the church or whatever there's a hundred different reasons people leave the church it's not all you know but it's kind of like you know i have a kids on mission they it's that's the internet age my son said dad you know they're asking me these, these questions i go out <laughs> and you know they go on the internet that night and the next my second lesson they're asking me all these crazy questions some of the book of mormon and i'm like well there are answers to a lot of those he goes, but I don't have access to them, you know, so I'll provide it. I think that's part of the problem too, is, is, is Book of Mormon Central is a good thing because it actually provides some place people can go, but it's that's still quite not, accessible and right. But it's still like ec extra canonical in the sense it's not really in the church. Right. And so people are looking for certain things within the church. And so when you say they don't know about them, it's because they're not being exposed to them any of these things you have to dive to find them yeah it's getting better you got podcasts you got things you know out there people can like do searches and and, and that's one reason i made all my books available for free mm -hmm. so it's like yeah anybody can read it because young people it's like they're not going to pay for a subscription to some academic journal <laughs> you know? no no bucks a year they're not going to buy you know an 80 dollar book um you know and so i just provide it you know, again, it's, as you said, it's maybe a little intense and kind of technical. I, I intend it in the future to do kind of some videos and, and make it a little more presentable. And like Brian Stubbs, he actually has his big book, but he wrote a little book that he thought was maybe for the layman, you know, a little bit more. Yeah, and that, that can be helpful to, you know, different audiences. But I hope this presentation has been, um, you know, a, a good overview of what's in your book. If you want to dive deeper, they can read your book geology right. and Mormon. i'll put a link in but hopefully people have enjoyed uh this presentation um and i think we'll wrap up part one here um talking about the main convergences between mesoamerica and geology volcanic eruptions earthquakes uh and how this sort of fits and is very consistent with the mesoamerica geography model and in part two we're going to talk about some other things maybe comparing the heartland geography mo model with geology talk a little bit about itself and a few other things as well uh that we can maybe yeah. talk about in part two so yeah again they're mesoamerican but they're scientific right i'm so i'm, I'm still sticking to the scientific inquiry awesome um, so. uh, and listeners if you've enjoyed this episode please give it a thumbs up like share and subscribe to my channel mornism with murph don't don't make sure you don't miss out in part two uh come back and watch that and we'll see you in the next episode and take care Bye bye. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a like, share it with others who might benefit, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can also listen to these episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify, and you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Check out my website for more content, personal blog, and more. And if you care to donate to support me, you can buy my PayPal or Patreon or through the website. And you can also give donations via YouTube through Super Chats. Thanks for watching Mornism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.